I don't have a real formal presentation here. This is more of a, a question and answer point of clarification. There seems to be, um, let me back up. I'm Chris Matrick, if you don't know me. I'm the district ranger here in, in Rochester, and I'm the responsible official for the Robinson Project. So I'm the one who gets to make the final decision on what will be implemented as part of that project. So um, do you all know one another? Why don't we go quickly go around the room and have everybody introduce themselves, just so we, in case you're, you're curious and you've forgotten somebody's name, even though you've known them for 15 years, it'll like pop into the, your head. I know one of that. OK. So Kevin, I'm going to start with you, and we'll go Kevin, that way. Kevin McLaughlin. Ruth McLaughlin. Judy McCurrier. Brad McCurrier. Matt Bear. Chris Williams. Harlan McCurrier. I'm Jay Strand, and I do work here. You may recognize your name, if not my face. Jason Weisfeld. David Hammer. Eric Bowman. Walt Wells. Tony Delorier. Got a few back there somewhere. William Brockhoff. Uh, Rod Lee. Linda Lee. Uh, Mason Wade. That was it. Well, All right. So now I can go back to where I was. So, and then Desmond is doing our videography for us back there. Um, but he's not pointing it at you. <laughs> no, he's pointing it right at me. Um, so, you know, we received, we had our, our official 30 day comment period for the preliminary EA that went out, and we received comments from a number of you, not all of you, but a number of you. Um, and there, through those comments, um, it became clear to me that um, there was some good comments in there, but there also seems to be a little bit of confusion still about what is actually being proposed, um, especially related to recreation um, in the area, but maybe some other general confusion. So there, there is not another opportunity in this process for public comment for you to like lodge official comments. We've had the two official comment periods. There is an opportunity to object. If, you so, if you've made comments at one of the official comment periods, you could object to the project. Um, and that opportunity is upcoming um, within a week or so, right, Jay? Something yeah. like that? Yeah. 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 Um, How will we be notified of that? Anybody. Will there be a notification of that a period of objection? Jay, we'll yes. Tell them the yes, there will be just like uh, just like when we rolled out the okay. EA for 30 day comment, it'll okay. be the same. Okay. For the objection. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It'll okay. last for 45 days. And you'll put will be notified. Yep. Well, pretty good, thank you. Yep. By email. Yep. Okay. Yep. It is objection the same thing as appeal. It is a pre-decisional process as, as opposed to a post-decisional process. So we will release the final EA and a draft decision notice, which is my decision, and that draft decision notice will stay in draft form awaiting the outcome of the objection period. So it'll sit there. I don't actually sign it. It just sits there. But it's what I would sign if no one objects. So it's just, it is like the appeal period, Eric, but it's, it happens before the decision is actually signed. It's trying to keep, um, because when you appeal, you often- Oh, so you're appealing the decision, that's right. You're objecting to the decision as well. No, but doing. I mean, the appeal is to the decision, yes. It was, there's no appeal appeal process any longer. Oh, oh, that's interesting. You object before, and then we try to resolve the issue re related to the objection. And then if- Can we all be done with the share that? <laughs> Okay. Okay. So you'll all be, if, if you made, everyone will be notified of the release of the final EA and the draft decision notice. And then if you had commented as part of the, one of the legal comment periods, and, and not all of you have, some of most of you have, I think, submitted some comments, you can then object on, you have to have raised that issue, right, in your comment. Jay, is that correct? Yeah, unless there's something new that's come up. Right. Um, any new information or new analysis that didn't occur during the first two <laughs> opportunities for comment, then you have the ability to object to that. Right. Yep. What so is this? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, mid September, is this what you're talking about? Um, next week it'll start. Yeah, I'd say within a week it goes, or so. It, it starts next week and then it's uh, the final date. 45 days. 45 right, 40 days. Day, 45 days. Yeah. 
I had got a problem with my email address. I gave it to somebody a couple of times. Brad, Brad uh, forwarded it to me today, or today or yesterday. I can't remember. I did. Yeah. So we have we have the we have the that email address now, Harlan. And I would get I would notify you. Yeah, I like stuff on the writing. on the phone or in it gets writing. Gets my attention. Yep. So what happened to the appeal process? It was um, removed through federal statute. They they changed it to the objections process. You have to ask Jay as to why they did that. And when was that? Um, it's three, been, three gosh, years ago, yeah, four it's years been ago. a while, it's been like five or six years. Um, the reason they changed it was, be, you know, was because um, when people were appealing after the decision was made and changes were being made as the result of trying to address the appeals, then we had, the, in many cases, this was agency-wide, changes were being made to the analysis and even sometimes to the decision and it became very messy because it was already supposed to have been a done deal. And also after a decision's rendered, there became this like iron curtain block of communication between people who were reviewing the appeal and those who actually wrote the analysis and provided the information to address the appeals. And so now if they moved the it's the same process, except they call it an objection because it's prior to the decision actually being made, like Chris already explained. But it allows us to fix or change or potentially even address through additional analysis prior to making the decision so we don't have to like go back and reopen up the comment period. Or, um, and also it allows free flow, of, free flow of communication between all parties. Um, so it just makes for a much more transparent process because post, post decision administration was like this very strict regulation that kept people from talking transparently with one another. It became very laborious. So that's why they that's why they changed it. And it seems to be working pretty well actually. The change I like to change myself because we can get things out up front before the decision is actually signed by the deciding officer. So we're still able to fine tune. Mm-hmm. Yep. There's a possibility, yeah. It is possible, yep. Thank you, Joe. Susan. Hello. Hi. Hello. Okay. Um, so my, my thought here was to kind of walk. The recreation proposals seem to be the ones that there's the most confusion around um, in, in bingo. Um, and I just wanted to be go kind of go through them one by one so that you understand what is happening, um, what is being proposed in bingo. We can talk about other parts of the Robinson Project, but certainly most of the, the questions and confusion seems to be related to bingo. Um, okay, is that all right to start with? Sorry. Very good. So I'm gonna go, see my little cursor bouncing around here? So I'm going to start right here because this is the, the, one of the current spots where the kiosk is right here, just past Jason's, the road up to Jason's camp, past the cemetery. There's a little roadside pullout there that has a kiosk in it. In our world, it's actually nothing, which is why you see no, no symbol right there. There is a kiosk there, but in our recreation in, inventory, or infra is what it's called, it, it doesn't exist as a site. So what we're doing is we're, and it's very strange to us to have this kiosk that introduces you to, you're now at the dispersed bingo campsites out here, way down here at the end of the road. And we have on occasion had people camp at that spot. Some people pleasantly camping, some people unpleasantly camping. Um, our proposal is to move it up to here where this P is. Now the P is much bigger on the map than the actual impact on the ground will be, because if we made a little tiny P, you wouldn't be able to see it on the map. This is campsite one, what's currently campsite one, the one that's right off the edge of the road. We're going to install that kiosk, or a kiosk very similar to it, at that location, do a little bit of site modification to make it able to handle a car pulling in there, or a couple of cars pulling in there. And this will be the introduction into the bingo campground area, the bing our bingo recreation facility that's down there. There will be nothing back down here. 
that grassy spot will still remain there. People will probably still, I will still park there when I go to walk my dogs out there because that's where I park now, but it's not a parking area. It's not maintained by us in any way. It's currently not maintained by us, the, the parking area itself. Harlan. So exactly what do you have planned for parking at that kiosk? I just said we're gonna. It's currently a camp a campsite, campsite one. You could probably park yeah. two cars comfortably there. Yeah. Um, we're just gonna smooth it out. There's some stubs sticking up there on the ground so that you could fit maybe three cars in that spot comfortably. So you could get off the road if someone were to stop and they were so looking no at the kiosk. Hundred foot long by ten. No, deep. no. It's gonna look almost identical to what it does now, except it will be a little. Like the, the firing will be removed. Some of the stub trees that people have cut in there that are on the campsite will be smoothed out. We'll probably put gravel down so that people don't sink in when they park in there, but we're not expanding it beyond its current, really its current footprint. And it won't be a campsite anymore? It will not be a campsite anymore. Will you post so, it one way or another? What's that, Eric? Will you post it one way or another? Po what do you mean post it? Yeah, well, Oh, it'll be if posted no camping at that spot, yes. Post no camping, but will you post kiosk? Uh, will it ever show up as no parking? Well, it wouldn't be no parking. No. People could still park, park there. Still park, park. park. So Yeah. Park. yeah. No, no camp. I mean, you're, Eric, are you talking about yeah, yeah. this location, what is now Campsite 1? No, no, no. No, no you're no, back down here. No, we won't. You're talking, where you're talking We won't about. post this no, okay. no camping. Okay. No. Um, or no parking, rather. We, we no, would no, post no. it no camping. We're gonna to try to just make it kind of go away on its own. Well, people will park here because they get on the path to the swimming hole in the summertime. Right, the and I park there to walk my dogs. Yeah, so you, you, you know, people don't want to. And other people park there. Park. You don't want to park on the road. Right. Hey, Chris. Jay. Um, we do say that we're going for four cars. No, we say 100 feet by 20 feet. That's about what it is now, though. Okay. That's not beyond what it is now. If you look at the whole campsite where from beginning to end, it's about 100 feet by 20 feet. It's, it's to accommodate four, four cars, four or five cars, because it's just a wayside, pull in, get your information, and then drive up the road Does to your campsite. Does that say parking 100 by 20 feet? It so says the parking area will be approximately 100 feet wide by 20 feet. That's what I thought. Okay. And that's about what it is now, Harlan. It's not, I mean, it's not too far removed from that. We're not going to change it considerably from what it is presently in its size. Well, 100 by 20 foot parking lot certainly is dangerous. I mean, well, what happens now, though, is people park in Flanders Road, which is where you don't want them. So what they're just parking. He's, he's up here. 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 He's Especially in the winter. So, you know, an extra couple of parking spots in uh, the um, kiosk <laughs> might not be a bad thing. Right, okay. <coughs> we, can't, we can't post no parking yeah, so the 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 Can you post a sign telling pe directing people where to park? Because really I have good. a problem with people parking right along my property and um, they're using the, they're parking there to go walk up in the forest or to use forest service land, and I'd like them to be directed to go use that public parking rather along my road. We can't post anything. We can't post on non-federal land. We can't put federal signs on non-federal land. So we couldn't post like in front of your house. We couldn't put a sign parking. But I guess we could if if you approved us putting a sign in front of your house. Yeah. You know, we're I also would. we're also a little more concerned about sign pollution out there. Too. Yeah. You know, too many signs, but. Well, we will just, certainly try to encourage people to park out, you know, where the parking is designated. How will you do that before they get there, though? Because well, people are still, parking along the road. This, this spot right here is still Forest Service jurisdiction right here, I where the current kiosk that. is. Yeah, so we could, we could put a signpost in there that says parking straight ahead. It doesn't do me any good. Back here, we're a little more challenged with putting parking so people park in front of your house they pr park along the road we have a, we have a drive that goes down and we have a, a separate gate. entryway gate, yeah. and they park along in there and there's trees along there so they think they think oh it's not a big deal but that road really isn't 
wide enough to have two cars pass by a person that's pulled over to park along there. Um, and there's also, point. you know. I mean, Chittenden, the Chittenden parking and campgrounds are four miles up, but you announce that right at the roadside so people know they have to go four miles to get there. At Bingo, you come off the road, people go down the road a quarter of a mile, they think they're there. Yeah. But they're really not there. You've got to go like another three so miles. So more put, putting Send something up the hell is out. Send them up the yeah. hell is out. <laughs> so I, just, I think the, pull on the, the place is right here. And, and, you know, it's just yeah, pull on the lack of knowledge. People would get off 73, they see the start road. Well, you prefer to stand on this area. Oh, we can get it. And, and of course, there's, a lot of, there's, there's not a lot of room for much of anything more in these houses on the corner there. Right. But, you know, some kind of a signage that might say, Bingo camping. Four miles or something, just a brief big sign that's clear, just so that people know we have got to go three miles to get to the recreational area. Right. Well, like much like you have a Chittenden off of 73. Right. So I'll say I'll say two things in response. One is it would have been great to know that when we were developing the proposed action for Robinson. I mean, we had numerous public meetings and opportunities to comment. This is the first time I've heard of that specific thing, Susan, about a sign down in that area. So you know, that's what we have all those public meetings for and opportunities to come and to get that kind of information so we can get it in the proposal. Secondarily, we don't need a NEPA decision to be able to put a sign in along a road to deal with a, um, a public information issue. That's not, we don't have to go through the whole NEPA process. So we can certainly work with you all on signing the end of the road appropriately so people know that Chittenden or Bingo Brook recreation area is X number of miles in. I think the challenge will be well, where does Bingo Brook recreation area as an undefined entity really begin? Sure. I mean, I would argue that it probably begins right here. I know that Harlan has property in Brad and, and Mason have property and a couple other folks have property up in here. But, you know, if you look at the block of Forest Service land, it really it really begins here. So we could work maybe with Andy, talk about putting a sign out here where the road number sign is, yeah. 42, and put a sign that says, you know, Bingo Brook Recreation Area, n X number of miles ahead. Camping, X number of more miles ahead. I mean, we can do that without having to get waylaid in the, in the NEPA process. So I'll, I'll, I'm gonna take a note and, um, and work with you all to get that kind of signing. Uh, I'm not saying it's going to prevent people from parking where they won't, because unless you get the town to park, host that portion of the road, no parking, um, or the state for that matter, um, host that portion of the road, no parking. Can you put a general. sign, do not blocky? We do have a sign there. There's already a sign. <laughs> it's just that people are confused. They, don't, they think they're there when they get there, but they're not really there. They don't know. Yeah. Is that Chris? Okay, so let me let's yeah, call yeah, on yeah, this yeah, note. It's, it's a fair point. We had, we had yeah. a couple pull off the road in that grassy area that we on the side of the road, sat down, put down a blanket, had a lunch. They had, I don't know what their religion was, but they had all the caps and the clothes on the heavy wool coats. It was 100 degrees outside. Yeah, right. Chris. Yes, Jeff. I've been I've taking on this point. If you just want to move on, I'll cross the Yeah, no, I know. Yeah. Just, uh, just so you don't have yeah. to delay the blanket. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm sorry, so, that more time. so you don't have to delay for yourself to take note 10 I didn't bother. Oh, you're taking notes. Okay. All right, very good. Oh, I just have one. Is that we, the parking issue, uh, I think, uh, for some of us, these folks, is post your meeting because there was a fair amount of, I think, um, attention drawn to parking uh, over the winter. And I think it's that. Can go there was attention yeah. brought to parking? <laughs> Not that place, but further down yeah. the road, and I'm sure you're aware of it. Which was unrelated to any forest no, service no, no, activities. No, no, no. I'm not, right. not saying that. I'm just saying parking yes. as a as something that's a sensitive issue right. perked up a lot. Again, but I'll, I'll, I'll push back a little bit. The 30-day the comment period opened on June 5th. So there was an oh, opportunity that at that point to raise an issue with parking. And it's not an issue. I mean, we can we can manage the signing and try to get people to the right place outside of the NEPA process. Mason. Uh, the purple is designating the Joseph Patel Wilderness? Or? No. no. Why don't you let me just move, move okay. through. Just so I'm going to try to do this in some kind of stepwise fashion so we all we stay on track and we're not still here at 9.30 or 10 o'clock, but I will be if you want to stay that long. I think I'm going to lose Kevin by that point, though. You bet. Okay. So 
So related to, so we're losing this campsite that's here. See the little campsite symbol here? So we're gonna lose that as a campsite. We know that this is a popular area to camp at certain times. It's not full all the time, but there are times when it's, it's busy. So we're going to add, we're adding two additional campsites because we don't want to decrease the number of campsites there. We're adding two additional campsites further out up here. See my cursor moving around? They were <coughs> former campsites. There were two of the sites that were closed when we did, when bingo was completely out of hand and people were camping in the river and doing things we don't want them to do in the river. Um, these were closed. They were pretty hard hit. They have rehabilitated themselves. They're already hardened. There is some adjustment that needs to be done to provide for parking because we don't want to allow people to drive up into them, which is what they used to do. So we'll be making some modification along the road edge to allow for parking and people accessing these two sites. They're way out of the end of the road. They're on the, on the north side. If you drive down there, they're the two sites that are up on the terrace. They say, yeah. right now they say, they no, say no camping. Camp. Yeah, no overnight camping. It's the trail that could take to get to uh, much there long. Yeah. Yeah, there is, there is some gold right. road up yeah. there that goes in that yeah. direction, yep. Yeah. So that's the, that's the change, changing to kind of information and camping along Bingo Brook Road. There's no other change, no other planned use, except, go ahead, nice. Oh, well, site two. Yeah, so site two, I'm gonna get to, but as far as addition, this campsite being taken away and the interpretive sign put there, this camp, these two campsites being added. Site two, which is right here, which is the one that's down away from the road. It's the biggest, maybe it's not the biggest site there, but it's the site with access. We're making some, we're expanding the parking down there a little bit to allow someone with a larger camper or a horse trailer to be able to get down in there and park and turn around. So you'd be able to, because right now you get down there with a trailer, there's, you're making, you're disconnecting and spinning the trailer around by hand, unless it's a real small one to get back out again. Is it dry camping only? Is it, what's that? It's dry camping only, correct? Dry, I'm not sure. So yeah, the, the, the trailer has to sustain itself without any. Yeah, we don't have any, we don't have any pump facilities or water or anything like that, mm -hmm. yes. Pack, all of our camping is pack it in, pack it out at this site. It seems funny you call it permanent camping, but they do the trailers in. Oh, it's, 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 it's houses down here. Thank yeah, you. it's actually Bingo Brook is a developed campground. Um, so is that the, the definition of primitive? Well, it's What's primitive the in that there's no water, there's no picnic tables, there's no. So okay. let me tell you the, the story behind what happened with Bingo Brook. It was a dispersed primitive camping location, and the camping there, as the longer term residents would know, is before my time, got a little out of hand at some point in the past and people were camping everywhere. Six, seven hundred people on. Yeah, so camp, pooping in the water, camping in, you know, just, it got, it got ugly. Everybody's camping along the river, everybody's using the facilities along right. the river, and the next rainstorm you got. Yeah. I can remember when Bingo Brook had the most coliform in it than <laughs> any other brook in the state. It was bad. So what happened at that point in time was we did a closure order on Bingo Brook except at designated sites. In order to designate sites, we have to number sites. Once you number sites in our world, it becomes a developed campground. So although the sign still says Bingo Brook primitive camping, it's really a developed campground where there, you can only camp at those sites. No one can come in and park in one of those grassy sites that looks yeah. really lush and nice because it's closed. So will you rebrand this somehow appropriately or will we still brand it as primitive? Uh, you can brand it how you, we, we just call it the Bingo Brook Campground. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Right. I think that would be the appropriate yeah. description. You can't reserve it, there's no fee to camp there, there's no facilities the other than fireways. We still say primitive. Yeah, and that's a holdover. Yeah, and I think there's a conflict between primitive and the 24-foot trailers coming in. And, and I'm not against it, I just think that it's, yeah. not, it's no longer primitive. Yeah, but there is no, no plan for water pumping stations. That was one of the things that yeah. was in someone's comment was, you know, that it was going to get developed into be able to, like, come in and pump your sewage out there. There would be something like that there. No, we're just making it suitable so that you could take a horse trailer or a larger trailer down um, to that location and camp. You know, how, how will that be disseminated and made, uh, the information be made available to people interested in camping? Or will, how will people know that that's the site for those trailers? 
That'll be, well, we, we have a recreation opportunity guide for Bingo Brook. Okay. So that'll be added, that'll be updated and added once the decision is signed, and then that'll be available on our website too. So that they're not in his yard trying to turn around a 40. Well, it's just, you know, <laughs> well, I, can't, I mean, I can't prevent that. I know, I know. And I'm thinking, you know, people go there now for what it is now. Right. When you start putting the neon sign up that says, trash this, trash here, this, trash this, you lose it. Right. You know, you lose it. And it just seems like incrementally, that's where we're headed. I mean, we're not changing the use. You know, I get it, I get it. Yeah. The logging will go away in a couple years, yeah. you know, and it'll be better years down the road. <laughs> Every, uh, this, some of this development isn't going to go away. It's only going to get worse. There's going to be more people. It's going to bring more people in. And then you lose what people go there now for. Well, you'll, it'll be, they're, they're, like I said, we're not changing the use. You know, we're adding one campsite, yeah, we're modifying yeah, okay. another campsite to allow a little bit larger vehicle to get to, and we're not talking about a fifth wheel. But I mean, we're no. talking about, you know, we're going to do this with it. I mean, already we got bicycle magazines with this proposed trail. Yeah. I mean, I've seen the influx just this summer of people with bikes compared to last year, you know, just with a couple of magazine articles, you know, so. Might, I mean, it's it it's nice that people could find something pristine, and you know, it gets around enough that way without putting a sign up. Right. You know, okay. that's all I'm saying. Okay. Mason. Okay. Uh, site King Site Two. Yeah. We're nice. talking about a horse trailer. Yeah. Okay. Adventure horse trailer it brings in three horse trailers for right. adventure activity with horses. Now, how many RVs are going to be able to uh, camp in here? And are generators going to be not allowed to be run? Um, there's no restriction on generators. Well, it's right run. downhill from my house. There's no, there's no well, your house back here, right? Well, it's uphill from the uh, from the. So there's no restriction. There's no restriction now on okay. anyone using a generator. Will there be a gate for the winter on that because of the way they, uh, that gets used for a high school partying down there? The the gate. That no, we, I'm talking about the gate on 42D. Which is camp there will be no. We don't have any plans to put a gate in Why here. Why not? Because we don't see the need to well, put a gate in there. Well, I, what happened last fall, my daughter and I were down there. There was two shit things that were dumped over in November, and I came in and reported it. Yep. But this is because there, it's too easy to get in there. Yeah. We need a gate on that location. Well, I, I would have a hard time justifying a, a gate on a dispersed campground that you can. Well, I'll tell you in. why. Because when the road is stopped plowed, it's still easy enough to get to 42D. It's a short enough distance mm -hmm. to, to run yourself in there. Okay. And there's a problem right there. I mean, it's easy enough to get in there. But you're, so I, again, I'm going to have a problem restricting restricting access to public land. Why? Because it's public land. I know, but you have a gate on 62. That's to protect the road resource. Well, let's protect the this river resources. So you're saying the gate would be closed at the same time in the middle as 62 is closed? Yes. Closed at the same time as 62. Well, I mean, if we put a gate at the right in front of Harlan's house and close that gate, as I offered to. To, uh, uh, yeah, that's not my jurisdiction. I understand, but yeah. I understand where my point was coming from. I, that yeah, issue I mean, brings up all the way first. past that, and then we should just eliminate all those concerns by letting the town put us the gate right there. At yeah, and that, that, that would that. be between the red, the, the, you, the I residents, and the right. town. But for yeah. you, 42D is a possibility to put a gate up that would be locked at the we same have, time as 62. Uh, we currently 62. have no plans to put a, a gate at 62, 42, so you'll 42D. Have a, so you'll be able to have a... Is there a year-round camping if you want to go to camp? You, you could walk out there and camp in the winter if you wanted to, or ski out there and camp in the winter if you wanted to. Oh, really? yep. but, but not a designated site. They, they could use a designated site, but they can go anywhere in the, in the woods. No, they have to do it. You're in the yeah. closure area. You can't, you can't camp anywhere in the closure area. You have to be in one of the in designated the sites in the winter. Have you issued any Don't you get permits for people for the campsites? No. 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 Tingle is free. Yeah. It's free, but they have to. No. They don't have a permit. They don't need a permit for scores come from scores. No, you don't need a permit to camp. And you can generally camp anywhere on the National Forest. Um, 
I have, I've had labs that big tail. Um, <laughs> you can camp anywhere on the national forest except where it's prohibited. So, um, and that's typically developed recreation sites or places where there's a closure order specifically in place like this location. So for 42D, we're going to let RVs in there. You could drive an RV out there now if you wanted to and camp. If you could and get in. And you can run your generators and have your TVs and your. And yes. Everything. And I'm telling you, it's directly downhill from my house. Okay, I, I understand that. But you're basically. encouraging RVs to park in, in 42D. They already do. You can bring a generator in the back of a pickup truck and drive in there. We're, we're just making it available so that someone could go down there with a horse trailer or a small tow behind trailer and get turned around. So that they're not going to get stuck down in there. Do I have a place to back up? It's going to be more of a, like a cul de sac. But you're also making it work for a couple of RVs. It, it's what already, it, they're you, already, you in already could there. drive an RV down there, Mason. I, I, well, you can't turn around as easily. If you're not, you build it better. If you're not, my, the, the only way I can put this to try to make this understandable is. We're not changing the use in a way that I anticipate that there's going to be a sudden influx of new use down there. I would I would guess that you're going to see the same level of use from camping at Bingo Brook. Okay. That it's not going to change in any significant way. So if it suddenly does change, you know, five years out, three years out, ten years out, we suddenly see all kinds of RV traffic down there that's that's unsustainable and having resource impacts. We'll respond to that at that time. Question then with the forest clearing around that campsite, what does that entail? Forest clearing. Yes, they, with the, the, the plan is the, for cutting the, the around The vegetation that management? Yes, because now that we marked every tree red on my northern property line, it relates to that cutting, I guess. So there's, there's no harvesting proposed anywhere yes, around your house, Mason. Uh, apple that, tree release? What's the deal? There's nothing. To see this green right here? This is just forest. Well, it's not green red where campsite 2 is. Right, you're down in here. I'd have to zoom into that. Yes. existing apple trees that occur in that area and cutting the competing vegetation around them to release the trees so that they produce better fruit. It's not a commercial timber harvest, it's done by hand. So it makes everything kind of look nicer for the campsite area? Well, it makes, no, it's done for wildlife purposes. Okay. Is there, is there, would it set a new precedence if it would be somehow illegal to um, enact a quiet time? zone for generators? Um, it, it does not. There already are quiet hours at campgrounds. Um, I don't, I was just camping somewhere else on the state park campgrounds. It was 10 p.m. and I don't want to say that it's 10 p.m. for our campgrounds right off the top of my head, but I can look that up and find out. It, it does not set a precedent. It would be, you know, we don't patrol at night, so enforcing it would be a bit of a challenge well, I mean, unless we had a chronic you know, if there was a chronic issue with one group of campers, you could then report it and then we could send Correct. someone down. Correct. Yeah. So, I mean, would it be possible in your new signage as you re sign this area and re uh, instruction, yeah. instructional use to create a quiet time for generators and campers? Let's at least get, yeah. it, get it out that, there. That, that's that's, that's, that's possible. possible, yep. You know, be courteous, be kind. You know, shut the motors off at 10 p.m. and don't start them again until 6 in the morning. <laughs> six, seven, eight, nine. But well, is everybody out of bed by 6 o'clock around here? I mean, home. Jesus. Not unless I hear the generator. Right. <laughs> well, then you don't have to set your alarm clock. My God, you're running down. Eric, put your hand up there. How oh, hard would it be to have like, some kind of. Wait a minute, Harlan. Eric's had his hand up for a while. <laughs> I had a question, uh, just a sort of clarification. Uh, there, there, with Campsite 2, you're 
saying that the proposal is to enlarge that to some degree so that you can move some sort of maybe an RV in that area and use it for horse parking as well. Are those concurrent uses? You mean like an RV and a horse trailer down there at the same time? Are you going to, is there going to be that would be up to the, whoever the user was. Well, uh, no, I mean, if you have multiple users. I mean, I mean, if you could have somebody drive an RV in there, can you then, is it all, is it okay for somebody needs. just to try to park their horse trailer in there as well? Ne you mean like next to the RV? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with what you're asking me, Eric. I'm sorry, I'm being a little Instead thick. Instead of camping, can you bring a horse trailer in there and park it for the day? If you weren't camping? Yeah. Um, if there was nobody else. Yeah, if there was right. nobody camping there, yes, because it's not like a, one of our fee sites where you can't leave. You can't have an unoccupied campsite. You can't occupy a campsite unless you're camping at, a, at our campground. Do you plan to limit the horses, like 20 people to a site? Do you plan to limit the horses to that site? There's no proposal to limit the horses to the site other than what would be limited naturally by you know, the, si the size of the trailer. And you wouldn't be able to, we're talking like a two horse trailer yeah. size thing, not one of those big long. Yep. I'm looking for the specific. Is that in the plan? It only can be a two horse trailer? Not a four horse trailer? Well, it's, it's more. Again, that's up to the user if they want to get wedged in down there. See a beautiful Saturday afternoon in October when any number of horse trailers show up once there's well, once they use their cell phones. equestrian trail. Is there going to be an area for trailers two through ten to turn around in the park? Beautiful fall day, yeah. the word is out, there's horse trails. There's no guarantee only one trailer is going to show up. That's correct, but once one person is occupying it, you wouldn't really be able to get another trailer down in there. Well, that's why I'm asking. Where are yeah. trailers through to through that is, to the again, that is up to the, the That is up to the operator of the trailer to figure out where they are going to go with that. And there would be nothing. There would be nothing preventing sites five, five, right across from Thresher Hill Road, is that five it's or up six? It's Hill, six is right, right The one right at the corner, yeah. right across from Thresher Hill Road, that big long site where um, Ellie and, uh, Ted, yeah. yeah, were a couple of years ago, where they've it's certainly gone. That's plenty big enough to accommodate another horse trailer. So somebody could go there now in horse camp. Somebody, there's no, there's no restriction on bringing a camper or a horse trailer in there right now to, camp, park, ride their horse. So that's really not going to change in any way. We're just providing a facility that will make it a little bit easier at that particular site. If somebody calls us and says, I got a horse trailer, I want to go camping. Is there a campsite that I can go to that's in the Rochester area? Bingo would be one of the places we could send them to site two. That we know that you could get down there, turned around with a trailer without getting wedged in there. Still first come, first serve. Though. Still first come, first serve, still free. So, so, so no camping, but want to go ride horses all day long. They could do that. There's no restriction. So you can that. have 10 trailers in there, nowhere. You won't be able to fit 10 trailers. I'm not talking there. about that particular location. I'm talking about Bingo Basin. You, you can do it now. You, you can, can do it now. Where are they going to park? Where are they going to turn around? Each campsite. No, Wherever they, they find space to turn around, they can well, drive out to the end of the road. That's another thing. They, that's, they can do all this stuff now. They can bike out there, but we're they can ride easy. horses out there. But yet, yeah, you know, we're going to take that campsite. We're going to be a big oval there, for supposedly only one RV and maybe a pickup and a, and a horse trailer. Why can't you just have a you know a drive-in with a campsite and just a good place where you got a straight shot at backing up? Instead of, you know, just making this thing huge, and then it's going to show up on a map someplace, and then it's going to be in a magazine, and then the next thing there's going to be a thousand people up there, and the next thing you know, we got the same problem we had before. Too many people in one spot at one time. No, because it's restrictions, just like with no, the campus. No, there's no, no, no restrictions. 14 yeah, people. But there's no restrictions. restrictions. Uh, in, no, I'm sorry. How many people? 14 days. 20, 14 days. 20 people. You can't have more than 20 people, but that's, that's, I mean, you wouldn't Talking be able to about Saturday. Saturday. At one site? I've never, never seen one first time. No, you have to have a group of 20 people. Yeah. You could. You know, just saying. I was always told you couldn't. Well, there you 
go. But now there's an app for that on the iPhone. Horse play. Horse play. So after I'm talking about one Saturday, the word's out, let's, everybody pig pile into Bingo Basin with your horse trailers and let's have our rodeo event. So the answer to that is the same as happened. camping. So it's, it's going to happen. Right. It's going to happen. The answer to that is the same as camping. If there's no more room, you have to drive out and go we'll somewhere else. Around. If the site is filled, the site is filled, you can drive out. We're not talking about that. Well, what I'm saying is for Dave. And if somebody's loaded up their horses, driven over a mountain, you know, for God only knows how far to go ride that day, they're just going to pull off to the side of the road, look. which isn't very well, They can't block the road. They, they have to go to a desert. We would, we, would, we would enforce that they can't block the road. So That's if right. we heard that they were blocking the road, we would go down and they were there, we tell them to move. If they weren't there, we would get them towed out of the way if they were blocking. Or eventually, we're going to. I, I, you. No, to be completely honest, I think we're overestimating, massively overestimating, the amount of use from horse perspective that this one trail, one trail managed for horse use, is going to draw people into this valley to get the 10, 20 horse trailers in here on a sunny day on an October afternoon to ride four mile, five mile, six mile loop trail. It, I am hard pressed to imagine that. The return on investment's yeah. not really that great. Yeah, I, I would just say I've been on the trails over in, um, over by Sugar Hill Reservoir within our horse trails and I I bike over there, I've never seen. Never seen a horse, right? I haven't Girl. seen yeah. it. Yeah. We, that, we, we did, this proposal, this proposal came out of the Vermont Horse Council, that first meeting that we had, they were here, they were one of the partners that was in the room. Um, and they, they had a request to um, enhance horseback riding opportunity within this project area. Um, they had a couple other proposals that crossed private land. They weren't able to secure the private land permission. I actually don't think they tried for, to secure the private land permission. We said that we would not pursue something that crossed private land um, without them first securing that permission. So this is the one remaining horse proposal because it's all on National Forest System land. It's all an existing trail already. Um, so it just needs a little bit of improvement to the water bars and the, and the clearing height to have a horse go up. And really the only portion of the trail that we're talking about that even needs that is this section right here of the Pine Brook Trail. This little beast up to the end of Thresher Hill Road. And again, I'm, I'm hard pressed to think that we're going to get 20 horse trailers in here, even on the most beautiful day, um, to ride that very short loop. But you're, you're cognizant of the concern your enforcement yes. officers do visit the place twice a day or once a day, and so now we just know that there's got to be a surveillance and monitoring, and if it becomes an issue, it'll have to be addressed. That's correct. And it's wonderful to have another designated trail. Same trail, but a, de another designated use on that trail. Yeah. Yep. So I think we beat site two up pretty good. We got some notes. We've got some, we heard we heard some of the things you were saying, and I think there's some things that we can do. You know, we can even sign the end of that road probably. You know, even though that there's a limited turnaround, that maybe they want to go down and check first to make sure that there's not a horse trailer down there already. Um, That's a good idea. This pink right here is the pine. What we call the Pine Brook Trail. It's made up of portions of, it actually comes back down here to the loop, but that's actually not part of the trail in our world. But this is the trail. This portion is Thresher Hill Road. And then this portion is Bingo Brook Road. Bingo Road. Yeah, this is 62, yeah. So this is adding the horse use onto that trail. That's what that pink is. How, how does that work with sharing that with the mountain bikers though? How, I mean, who, how does that work? We don't, we don't, and there, it's such a low use trail. Um, we realize that there's, you know, Harlan said there's been an uptick this year. They're probably riding that, although I just walked by it the other day and it's pretty heavily grown in at the beginning, so they're not riding it too, too much. Um, 
again, that would be we don't anticipate a conflict between horses and bicyclists as long as they're, if the trail is wide enough. Um, certainly the roads are wide enough for that, so the only place that there might be a conflict would be in here. Yeah. And we don't have any documentation. We talked to both user groups, and they, they're not concerned about potential conflict. How, just how does it work, though, if you have a biker and a horseback rider, and the biker's supposed to just get off? The, the biker would have, to, would have to give way to the horseback okay. rider. Yeah. And I, I just wonder too about that that section where you're coming down. I, I bike down. I do that loop and yep. and um, you come down. I come right. down. So down. if there's a horse come coming up, it would far. be hard for me to stop quickly. Yeah, and that's the. I would say the horses yeah, should be going the, that way. Some of the improvements are in the, the, of the clearing width that to provide additional sight lines yeah. on that, so that you would be able to see each other right. at a good enough distance that you'd yeah. be able to stop yeah. or yeah. slow down or. Or they should just be aware the bikers coming down right. fast might not be able to. Right. So the blue line should be up over Philadelphia to Hancock. Okay, so this right here, on these blue lines, so that one, this one, and this one, I'm getting a little bit outside of bingo here, but they're all the same, um, are decommissioned trails, trails being proposed to be decommissioned. So the Facet Basin Trail um, is gone and not coming back, the estimate to recreate that trail in a sustainable manner is up close to if not over a million dollars it's not going to happen um, so that trail is being decommissioned this is the smith brook road 61 it's also got the smith brook trail overlaid on it this is an administrative act to take the trail off the road the road will be there you can walk on the road there's no reason for us to have a trail designation overlaid on a road designation it doesn't make any sense and then this is the Philadelphia Peak Trail. Um, this was never intended to be a, in our database, it's an administrative trail only, and it's an administrative trail to access the repeater site. Um, and with the repeater being proposed to be removed, um, there's no need to have the trail. We don't plan to obliterate the road. This doesn't mean you can't walk up there. It just means we are not managing it for a trail because we never have managed it for anything more than an administrative access point. So the road will there, we're not gonna obliterate it, we're gonna leave it in place, um, and it will just grow in over time. The purple up here is all wilderness, so it, it just doesn't go anywhere for us anymore. Is that just a Battelle? This is Battelle, all, this all the purple lilac color is all the Battelle wilderness. So you can turn the green into purple? Uh, no, Congress could turn the green into purple. Oh, good. Oh, shit. You would then have Our very limited access to your home. <laughs> I don't know about that. And it's, it would be highly... Look at those forests. Look at, uh, uh, Tell me what good they are. They're overgrown. There's no feed for animals. That's the same problem that we've had over in our basin. I can remember every time you went out, you'd see deer. You don't see deer. I haven't seen deer in 15 years. <laughs> you know why? Because there's no growth. They used to come out where there used to be pasture land once a year. National Forest would come out with a brush hog and brush hog. But they're not. But they don't. And now they've all grown in. It's all woods. You can't find the old apple well, trees up in there to, anymore. What happened to that work? You know? What happens? So don't happens? tell me about wilderness. That's the biggest bullshit in the whole friggin' country. <laughs> disagree. I'm done. No, I disagree. <laughs> Unfortunately, wilderness is important to a lot of people. So but it's not good for the land. Well, that's disagreeable too. But we won't go there right now. That's not part of this message. So as I look through here, the only thing that I see that we haven't talked about specifically is this yellow line right here. Okay, so this is the proposed route of the what's called the Bellamont Trail. So the Bellamont is um, is an idea of the Vermont Huts Association and the Vermont Mountain Bike Association. And it's in, we'll, we'll call it end to end. Whether it actually ends up being end to end is, is somewhat in question. They're not even sure they desire it to be end to end, but a long distance mountain biking trail, similar to the long trail for hikers, the Catamount Trail for skiers, single track mountain bike trail that would run essentially from the end of the state to the end of the state. Right now they're talking about from Stowe 
to Killington. That's the area that they're concentrating on. Um, and it would have huts that you would be able to like stay in the huts as you pedaled along. What they're really trying to do is connect pods of existing mountain bike trails, like networks of mountain bike trails, Blueberry Lake trails, for example. Um, th there's a big trail network up in, in further up into in Wakesfield, and then there's one up in Stowe. They're trying to connect them with this Velamont trail so you'd be able to ride the trail, ride to the next trail, stay at a hut, ride that trail system, then keep working your way down. This is the proposed route as it passes through this area. Um, so the dashed line right here, you see how this is dashed? So this is all existing. This is an existing, this is the Swans Mill Road, the Swans Mill Trail, it's a snowmobile trail, it's a road for much of it. Um, the black and yellow dashed right here is something that, it doesn't exist. That doesn't mean that there's not a trace out there that it would follow. Um, but it doesn't exist as an existing road, a managed road, a managed trail. Because um, I, I mean, we know that there is, a, there is some trace of a road here. We do know that there is a trace of a road up here. There's a trace of a road right here if you look real close. So this is what's being proposed. It's a proposed crossing of Bingo Road. There's not a parking lot planned. There's not a kiosk planned in the way of a, like a trailhead planned in the way of like a kiosk, like announcing like here crosses the Belmont stop here and ride. It's just a crossing. The hub is over here at the parking lot for Chittenden Brook Campground and then up at Chittenden Brook Campground um, where there's a hut going in on one of the campsites there. So that's kind of the destination. And then back this way, the destination is here. You're sitting right here because the trailhead is going to be over here at North Hollow Farm, Martin Farm. And then this our trail in back of the office here, the Sap Boiler Trail, is one of the little features along this long distance. So the trail. access right now on this end is where? Would be here. On the north end would be here. Would be here. Would be here. Okay. So you would go from here. Well, Martin Farm. Yeah. So you could park here, you could park there. You would go up, you would go along the old power line on the other side of the river, and then up the Rochester Tunnel side up that trail. There's some new trail construction to switch back creation so they can get up across Swans Mill Trail, down to the end of 155A Flanders Extension next to Jason's. It would come, probably come up right, right, right there somewhere. The exact spot we don't know it'll be up to the trail design but somewhere in that vicinity and then cross and come up the other side so Ho Chris, hooking so Jones bingo is road. like bingo road is like halfway point roughly so um a shortcut not really halfway point halfway point would be somewhere kind of up where swan it says swans if you're it depends on what work you're measuring uh, from so this and you know but you could park to do a shortcut uh, to cut down on your your loop it's not a loop. Well, it's not a loop, but you, you could create a situation where you could shorten the the, uh, the ride by parking at Bingo for a car shuttle. You, I'm, I'm, I, I can't say that you couldn't do that. Right. But we're not putting any infrastructure at that location you for parking to. or you a kiosk. You don't have to. You don't have to. It's yeah. just, that's the fact. It's halfway. And well, a lot of folks aren't going to want to do the whole thing. They want to do half the thing, and they'll organize to do half rides and park. We go run. I mean, it's, and it's a natural point. process. Uh, let, let, let me just add it to Jason first. Just to clarify the point I made in my comments, mm -hmm. that it appears on this map that uh, that trail does cross Bingo Road at Flanders Hill. Right at the bottom. I mean, it's proposed. I think in the description in the, in the project, it talks about one coming down somewhere in the area where 155A is, where you and I walked well, up that and day. So I, I'd have to endorse the point that's being discussed. There's a natural parking area yeah. there, mm -hmm. and we yeah. know that people cluster there every day of the week. Yeah. I don't know if you park at the kiosk, but, I park uh, at the kiosk, but Bruce and I other, park Bruce and others uh, yeah. park at Flanders Hill every day. Yeah. And if that's a known crossing point for that trail. It's going to be a trailhead, whether you call it a trailhead okay. or not. Okay. And I can't, I can't argue, I can't argue yeah. the point that someone. So my suggestion out. was, if you have flexibility, I personally would appreciate that you cross Bingo Road at your current kiosk, where you already have natural parking, where you're already using it to walk your dog, 
and avoid adding more people at Flanders Hill. That was my request. If you have flexibility, move it to the west. I'm a little confused, Jason. At the current kiosk, or just on the other side of the bridge? Right. But we still have to get across the bridge. Well, they can walk, yeah, but the, for the parking is what I'm talking oh, about. Oh, okay, all right. So, so oh, okay, I see what you're saying. So, if they're, you're saying to actually the designate came out parking there existing for that space, if, if people are going to congregate there, designate the parking for that crossing where the current kiosk Correct. is. Okay, I see, already I see what you're saying now. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't get that from your comment, so I'm glad we were able to clarify that. Yeah. <clears throat> Just, uh, can I go to Linda's? <laughs> yeah, just two more questions. Uh, so, what's the time frame for when you think this is going to get there? Yeah. And then, um, how long the road do you know approximately is the rest of that? You know, it parallels the road. Is that oh, like, I see. Twenty uh, feet, two hundred feet. Uh, yards, so feet. this is conceptual. Okay, this, this, this drawing, the, the map is conceptual. It had, no one's been out on the ground. They've kind of looked at the topographic map, looked at the connections, and said, okay, this is where we see it going. We've had a little bit of ground truthing of this, so, but for me to tell you that that would be exactly where, well, for, me, for exactly. me to say that it's going to be like, you know, here versus being here or yeah. being there, it, I can't. I can't. I, I would be making something up right now if I were right. telling you, right. and I don't. And I don't fair, want to do fair, that. Fair enough. But the time frame is like. Time frame is uh, also not able to really define that because it relates to um, funding, okay. and fund and some funding that some funding that would come through us, which would be if that was the only time frame we were relying on. I would say that we probably wouldn't have proposed it in the first place, because funding for trails is um, on the decline from the at the federal level. But because Vermont Huts and Vermont Mountain Bike Association are doing, they can do fundraising and they can put that money to federal, to trail construction on federal land. Um, it would depend on their fundraising, their, their ability and where they're at. Yeah. So it's probably, I'm just gonna I'll guess, you know, you're talking about if the decision is signed next week and nobody objects and we get to a final decision by October, um, you probably wouldn't see any ground, new totally trail ground nice broken there for at least a couple of years. A couple of years, yeah. Is this coming out in the field at the end of 113? Is that where you, because there is a remnant of a road that died. Yeah, this is following, I believe, that remnant of a road. Yeah. I haven't walked this portion right, right here. I've been on a little bit of this, and I've been on a little yeah. bit of this, but yeah. this portion, I think that is where it is I coming mean, out. I mean, it just needs to be clear. It's from, you know, the, all the hurricanes, the blowdowns and stuff, the trees are crossing. Well, it would be, yeah. I mean, the, the trail would be. The road is very obvious. So the concern is the field. The field is a kind of special place. You keep the trail on the side of the field. It wouldn't go up the middle of the field. Is the field actually on federal is that, land? It's at, oh yeah, it's at the end of 113. It's a really neat field. I think this is beyond that field then. You think it comes out after the field? It comes in, the this, I think that comes up into the forest because okay. that right. field is right on the edge at the end of 113 where it goes from federal to private, okay. private federal boundary. Yeah, I wouldn't want to see it come through that. It's, that's not where that field, again, but I don't know exactly yeah. where it's going yeah. to go. But you're familiar with the field. I am familiar with the field. I yes. to see that thing uh, trampled by a light trail when you can avoid it. Eric. <coughs> Well, Harlan looks like he's about to run out the door, so. No, oh, no, 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 I was just, I was just getting ready. I gotta use the map for my phone. <laughs> you see, he was about to run out the door. Professor. <laughs> but I stepped on you once already, so. <laughs> um, all, in a sense, these are all still proposals because all the construction the real construction yep. of the building yep. is dependent on what the archaeologist says. And the botanist and the soil and, scientist. Yes, and you and still have a fair amount of examination yep. before anything moves, or anything moves on the ground. Right. Yes. Yeah, there will be site-specific examination has yet to be conducted on yeah. the Bellamont Trail. Yes. Well, so. Yeah. But I mean, you know, the, the point that. the point would be that it's not going to go suddenly from you know, no, here yeah. to it's over right. here, or here to, oh, well, we're gonna actually connect up here. We're gonna, we're gonna propose like going through Jace's property and then, you know, running up and through. You know, it's going to say somewhere in this, you know, in, in the sphere of influence of that line, 
it's not going to go because it's been truthed enough to know that the ground is suitable for that activity, but whether it's here or 200 yards that way or 300 yards that way is not yet known. But yes, bark, botany, soils, everybody would have to go and look at it. And that one particular junction at the bridge and his drive yep. has lots. Yeah. has a lot of stuff. Yeah. Plus, there's uh, just below the cemetery, there's a site that was <laughs> excavated by the local historical society of the school there. Right, yep. And and so, I mean, <laughs> there's there a fair amount of shuffling around, there. I think. There was a, Rochester's whorehouse was up there some, at one point, too, right? Oh, it's it's a a same spot that you're talking about, Harlan. There's no proposed haul route that would connect Bingo Road to up here. I don't know how you do it. A few hundred yards. Yeah, so it's about a ledge. Cliff. Yeah. Well, but there's a road that's cut in. They'll be, we'll, we'll be hauling things, skidding things this way, and then hauling things out the other way. I, I was wondering about the, the proposed bike trail. No. But you're seeing that line is, you're not seeing any connection. I was talking with Bruce and he was telling me that there was something coming down into the, uh, you know, the plantation pine below my place? Yeah. Yeah. Just, just, just this, up, just this just side of your where place. That, where it washed out there, where the river's real close to the road, towards yeah. my place. Yeah. There's an old skid trail that comes down. And he was saying that they were coming down. No. They were going to hook him. There's no connection. The only connection okay. you're seeing is, but the only touch of Bingo Road is back in this, this area here. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I, so I have one last question about this. Uh, do, you, do you have any control over this in terms of permitting? Uh, in other words, would they have to come to the Forest Service and say, we'd better ride, there'll be 100 bikers coming through over the course of 12 hours on such and such a date. Do you have to get that request and approve it? Um, depends. Um, so there's, there's something called non-commercial group use. So if you have a group that's going to gather on the forest, even if you're not charging money, and it's over 75 people, you need a non-commercial group use permit, for example, the rainbow, rainbow gathering that's currently <laughs> happening up at Texas Meadow, <laughs> up at Texas Meadow, non-commercial group use. They're not selling anything, but they need a permit, so they have to come up. Rainbows are a different oh, case. Going on in yeah. So, so they would need to come to us, apply for a permit, and we would either we, we would have resource specialists, and everyone can look at that, um, and then determine whether it was there was going to be some kind of adverse impact. Okay. If there was a business that said, you know, we're we are going to do a race and we're going to charge an entrance fee for the race, that would also require a permit. Okay. So you have some measure of control over large crowds. Yes. Okay. This sounds like the tour de Rochester already. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And all six of us will ride. They the the road road. Road. Yeah. 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 We're going to need two days. And our range will be <laughs> just as <laughs> long. I, um, just looking at the um, Belmont article that was in uh, Vermont Outdoors or whatever that magazine that had it in it, I mean, they stated themselves that huge, huge demand for um, mountain biking, and this is why they want to do this trail. And I, I think it's a really legitimate concern to think 
I mean, if I was looking at that map, I would, I would definitely look at, okay, I can park here and do that yeah. park. So I, I just think that that, I mean, I, I feel like the ski area on 73 was very underestimated of the demand and use there, and I'm very concerned that that will happen here, and then we will be talking about this after the fact, after it becomes a problem, rather than proactively looking at it and saying, <laughs> really, how can we avoid that? Because I think there is a huge demand for the mountain biking, and I, I would definitely look at that myself, at that map, and say, yep. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do, because I'm not going to do that whole trail, but I could do that part and go back again and, and get, go out and back on that. Um, but where are, those people gonna, where are those people going to park? Yeah, so that, that I mean, Jason, your, your point is well taken. Yeah. Um, we are going to actively, um, from a Forest Service perspective, and we'll work with Rasa to do the same, we're going to actually direct people to here. You know, another one that I thought of, um, if it did become just, uh, you know, much more popular than you imagined, was directing people to the CCC camp. Park there, right up the road to it. Yeah, yeah. that's a great idea. Yeah, that's not, I mean. Where are you going to direct them to? The, yeah, you, the camp. I mean, that, you, be, that might be a fall, that might be a fallback position. Right. Um, because what if it we is? Really wanna, we really want to get people here. This parking lot's going to get reconfigured as part of this project. The two entrance Y at Chittenden Brook is going to get changed to a one. The state wants them all changed to a single entry, which is going to give us more space to provide parking at the end there for the winter use, because that's a nightmare in the winter down there. And nobody, not a lot of people park there in the summer, but we'll have more capacity right here. And with the hut up the road, and there's going to be a small little pod of single track kind of nested loop trail right at the campground, that's going to draw people up to the campground. So. We're going to, whoopsie, you don't want to read my email. Um, we're going to try to direct people here, but you know, that's why I couldn't say that no one is going to here, but we're going to actively try to deter people from using this as a rally spot. Um, it just, but it, the idea of providing some limited parking there, uh, that's kind of a double-edged sword almost. You know, is it better to say there's no parking there? You know, when people come in, you know, you're not going to go, don't go to Bingo. That's not a good place to access the trail. Go, go over here to Chittenden Brook and provide no parking. Or do you say, well, there's limited parking at Bingo Brook? If they want to do the loop, they can do the loop this way. You go down to Bingo Road, right back up Bingo Road, and back up 73 to Chittenden. Yeah, I mean, you could, you could do a loop. They're, they're trying to, they're actively trying to avoid road rides. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, they don't want to have to do so. We don't view this as a loop. This is like destination from here, you know, to here, to the campground, to the next spot. It's not, we don't anticipate a lot of people going, oh, okay, I rode from the Rochester office to here and now I'm going to ride back. You know, they're going to, these kind of people are going to keep going. Yeah, so the they got to ride back. These guys are hardcore. They don't do anything halfway. So they're going to turn around and go back to their car. No, they're going to stay at the villa one. No, they're going to stay at the hut and move on. The people who want to ride, like, ride, just ride and then come back, they're going to be more drawn to the Sherburn Trails, to Blueberry Lake, to the Sap Boiler back here, to these other, like, pods of trails, like the Blueberry Lake Trails. They're going to ride those and then go home. It's going to be the hardcore people who do the Velomont. They're going to do Blueberry Lake, and then they're going to ride down to the office here, and they're going to do this, and then they're going to ride down to the Sherburn Trails and do that and ride to Pittsburgh. Oh, it's just a picture. Oh, it's just a picture. Here. Could I ask a question behind here? You, um, you may, yeah. I, I can't see the hands behind, so just throw something at me. Um, so someone mentioned archaeologists, and um, I wondered uh, what that's in reference to. I know I've walked up there with an Abnaki person to look at the <coughs> the piles of cairns. Cairns, yep. cairns are they yep. called? Uh, is, there, is that the issue, or an issue no, there's, what, or are there other remains? I'll defer to Eric a little bit, but it's not Karen's, it's the, it, it, in this area, what Eric was referring to are more historic sites, cellar holes, oh, um, foundations, uh, barn. I don't know about the whorehouse, you might talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> but I could uh, put my finger up on that map and show you lots of places. Yeah. And, and lots of places, places where that trail what? crosses, where, they're taught, where there's parking near. There, <laughs> that hasn't been resolved, I don't think, at all. So the, the, there, there's, there's, this is a very um, historic, rich area from Cellar Holes Foundations, other, you know, post-colonization sites, you know, 1,800 sites, well, some 1,700 sites, right? Yes, but uh, 
the State Historical Preservation Office has told the forest archaeologist he is to do a Section 106 examination of every site. Yeah, they now, are. If, now, if you have a site that's got ground disturbance, or, or if you have a project that's got ground disturbance nearby, that means he has to dig test pits. He has to know what's in the ground. Yeah, Eric, I mean, not Eric, um, Andrew is in close consultation with the state archaeologist uh, on all this stuff, and they've, the current seasonal archaeologist, Mallory, she has been out documenting all of the known and, and, and discovering some of the unknown sites, that rep, the stuff that you've been passing along. Oh, no, I've been with Mallory and, yep. and shown her what stuff. So she's, we're, we're getting good <laughs> documentation, much better than what we used to get. We used to have, you know, think of the days before we had GPS systems and things, you get a point on a map, and we all know that the archaeological site, we've learned the hard way in some cases, that it's not just at the point. It's bigger, so we're getting polygons now, which oh, helps yeah. us a great deal. I mean, any archaeological site has area, right? Has space. Yep. And that was that was the one large missing ingredient, I think, in documentation. Right. And now we're, we're getting that, which is which yeah, is yeah. which is. But great, I do so. want, to, if I can digress just a smidge from the general subject matter that I was with Mallory, we are up. Uh, must be have been along the part of the road that goes to um, Swan's Mill. Is that 63? 64. This 64, right here. 64. Yeah. Right here. Uh, there was a site uh, um, flagged by her. I mean, a, a, a polygon, a, a no fly zone. Uh, and then after the establishment of that, of that uh, no fly zone, there's a flag line running right through it. So hmm. why is there a flag line running through it? Can you tell me where that is so that we can resolve that? Yeah, I'm sort of well, sure. You want me to point it out right now? Well, better, better if you could send me an email and give me some information where it is, and I, I'll pass that along. I don't know what the flag what the flag line. Yeah, well, I uh, I talked to Andrew, and <laughs> his response was, "Oh well, it's kind of temporary." I said, "Yeah." It would be temporary until it's temporary until it's not. It's temporary until it's not. So that's why yeah, I want to, I want yeah, to know. No, temporary until it's not. Yeah. What comes after the flagging? Paint, usually. Right. So that, that's what I want to find out, where that is and what the flag line is actually indicating. Um, okay, thank you, Eric. If you find more of that, please let me know. This, the sooner the better yeah. when you find it. I think we've exhausted the bingo area from a recreation, special uses. I can't think of any other special use. So the, the Philadelphia. Okay. So the only other thing related to this is the Philadelphia Peak comm site coming out of the of the wilderness. This isn't going to happen tomorrow because what it says in the proposed decision is that you know once we establish two additional repeaters, one on Corporation Mountain and one up back here on the Braintree Range, we'll remove the Philadelphia repeater, but that's going to require funding to do that. So we have, we'll have a decision to remove this in the portion of the wilderness, the portion of the removal site that's in the wilderness, like the repeater site itself and the road down to here, um, we'll be using um, stock animals and people power to get it out. Um, once it reaches here, we've, we've left the option open that we might use a, a UTV, we might continue to just use stock animals to bring it down um, to the end of the road, and then the staging site is actually the gravel pit um, on Thresher Hill. We're not going to park in a whole lot of equipment up at the end of the road because of, there's a lot of archaeological features right there, and we just don't want to like have stock animals wandering around or some truck backing into something, so. Who they, owns the repeater? The government owns the repeater. The government owns yeah. the Summer or winter? Summer or winter. Oh, 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 removal. In the well, time? We haven't specified it would be probably, we would be looking for a dry, non-frozen ground situation. Oh, you want a non-frozen ground? Yeah. Uh, it's it's safe, safer for the stock animals. Oh, okay, but, sure. So we'd be looking at you know the dry part of the year, which is like right now. Right now. <laughs> 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 
And that, the reason we're doing that is that's we, we've gone through a minimum, what's called a minimum requirements analysis. Anytime you do anything in wilderness, you have to go through a minimum requirements analysis. It tells you what the, uh, it analyzes what kind of impacts various techniques to do something in wilderness would have. Um, so like taking it out with people, flying it out with a helicopter, we can get authorization to do that um, on a one-time occurrence using stock animals. Um, and in this case, we determined that um, using stock animals was probably the, the best for wilderness and wouldn't break the backs of many people carrying all that stuff out. Let's say that because um, that's a non um, non conforming tool in wilderness so we can get an exemption um, but it was felt at the end of the day that we could comply with the wilderness act and use stock animals because the distance isn't all that great if we were talking about up somewhere in the middle of the wilderness and it would have been miles and miles and miles to get out the helicopter would have probably risen further to the top if they get the funding, you know, if things work out favorably from the remaining examination mm -hmm. and it stays close to target path, mm -hmm. would you wait until all the logging activities are complete and skidding and logging trucks are done before you open the trail, or would you allow the trail to open in the middle of that logging activity? Yeah, you're, you're hitting on something that's an internal struggle for us at times. Um, is trying to uh, sequence plan things. Yeah, yeah. So what will happen once the decision gets signed and we know what's approved is we're going to develop an implementation plan internally and that will set forth like when are we going to harvest timber here, when are we going to harvest timber over there, when are we going to do, some of it will be a shot in the dark, like when are we going to remove the repeater, you know, we'll try to establish a target date for that. Um, my, that's, you know, I will look to my timber and recreation staff to have that discussion, my gut would tell me and my inclination would be that yes, you would want to wait until you finished harvesting timber because why would you want to put a bunch of infrastructure in and then potentially damage that infrastructure with skidding and felling of trees only to then have to put it back in again. So I was thinking more of running over bikers. Yeah, you don't want the public in there. Yeah, that's, <laughs> well, that's what I mean. They, they don't stop. They, they just don't think. We, I almost got ran over the other day with two, two mountain bikes just walking up my road. It wasn't me, was it? No. <laughs> no, but I was a little shocked oh, by the speed oh. of the bicycles. Was it Susan? No. <laughs> <laughs> but they're fully helmeted. I have the feeling Susan comes well, you're ripping down that hill. Now I'm going to keep my wife's about three miles an hour last week. I'm not helmeted. It's a hello. They were. <laughs> Yes, right. That's right. So now I got to wear a helmet to walk to my house. Yes. Yes. Well, if you fall, you won't crack it. I just have a question. My concern is the uh, Landers Cemetery, yeah. um, and maybe you talked about that earlier. That came a little late. Right. How are you protecting that? We're right there. We have. Um, there's no recreation activity planned anywhere near the Bingo Cemetery. But the road down below, though, right? I mean, the Flanders. Oh. Down. Way. We're not, no, the road that goes right by it is Flanders Road, the town road, right. Flanders Hill Road. We don't have any activity planned on Flanders Hill Road. Okay. So but from, from recreation, I'm going to look from a timber perspective. But down below. You're going to do some logging to each side of it, right? That's what I'm going to work Yeah. Uh, no. no. So let me zoom in way in on this one so we can really good look at it. Anymore. Down to your right. We've eliminated it. Yeah. Okay, so you'll see here's the here's this is the cemetery right here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there's no activity directly adjacent to the cemetery. It's buffered by this green. It's just going to remain forest as it is now. This is the road. So we will haul down the road um, to harvest this unit right here, and the wood that comes out of here, and the wood that comes out of here. We'll be at a landing that's a pre-existing landing on that road. Jason, you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, Not existing anymore, but yeah. But it was there. It was a landing at one yeah. point. Yeah. Um, so that'll be reopened up and that'll be the landing. So all this little bit of wood that's coming out of here is going to go to this landing and be hauled out right there. So it's a pretty small amount of wood to be going by the cemetery. And that'll be, that'll be quick. Um, that won't take them very long to harvest. Chris, are the, are the heavy red lines um, logging access roads of some sort? Yeah. These lines right here? Uh, like rated H8. Oh, the, no, the, this, we see this H7, H8, H6. These are harvest unit boundaries. So when we plan timber harvests, 
we, we, there's, there's compartments and stands, like compartment 10, stand 258, compartment 10, stand 255. I know you know this button, but so on and so forth. And then we bundle them into these harvest units so that our resource specialists, when they're looking at that area, because as you can see, all of the activity, the haul, hauling, landings, aren't with necessarily within compartments and within those stands. There's activity outside of the stands. So the resource specialists know that, okay, when I need to look at harvest zone six, I need to look at the area within the boundary of that harvest zone. So like the botanist would not just walk through here, she would also take a walk out, out, out here in the green just to make sure that there wasn't some resource of concern out there. Archaeologists would do the same thing. In that light green is shining. This is just staying. Not, no harvest activity plan. And the dark green is? The dark green is, the dark green is a thinning. 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 Yeah, that's one. And the purple? <laughs> um, purple, the purple, the dark purple is group selection. So that's what that's what's proposed behind your house, Harlan. That's where they create these um, quarter acre, half acre, one acre openings scattered across the landscape with mature forest in between them. What's the view shed? View shed. I know, I know. It's just a thing. Oh, you're photographing yeah, at a document? I read it somewhere. Yeah, so in some places up along right the long trail, we're creating view sheds. So we'll create just a little notch yeah. opening where there's an opportunity to get a view out of the valley. Yeah. Like, just to think of it like a visit. Yeah. Are they, they clear cuts. In red, the, the blue is. Red. Red. There is no red up there. Oh, red. The, 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 the drummer. Just to the yeah. north. East. The, the blue. Uh, the slate dark brown. It's the brown. S549. The dark brown. Oh, that's opening. That create or no? You only point to it. Yeah, make sure I get this right here. Yeah. That's that's either create or expand an existing opening. So that's a, that would be a permanent opening, permanent wildlife opening. I can't think right off the top of my head. Is there an opening up there, Jason, on that side of the road? No, it's all grown in. Down. Oh, yeah. Was, that was there one at one time? When they were logging it. When I think yeah. it was Forrest Johnson. That might, have, that might have been one of the ones that we were talking about before that we used to maintain and we've let go for yeah. many years. Yeah. We're There's trying to claim some There's of them. There's a cellar hole there, too. Yeah. yeah. So it's an, archeolo yeah, it's an archaeologic site. <laughs> yeah, so it's an old, old farm. So we might be trying to reclaim what was the old pasture <laughs> around that arch site. So what you're not seeing is we do have a data layer that shows where all the archaeological sites are, where all the rare plant sites are. Of where all the features of concern are. This is just what goes up to. We'd like to see that map too. for review. Yeah. Hmm. I'd like to see that. But I have to go well, through so a security clearance process oh. to be able to see that. How many, like, 1,700 sites there might be in this project area? Um, oh. <clears throat> I've never seen a you couple of You mean in the higher bingo or in the harvest zones? Or just, just in general in rot, this, this project area. I mean, I, I know I've seen some center All chimneys. In, in the area that they're now designating as harvest zones, which is sort of, a, you're seeing just the edge of it, because actually it, it extends further what northeast from that yes and that probably i mean the number overall is small but that probably is close to 80 percent of the number of the total 
18th century sites in Europe, in the forest, in the, in the Bingo area. In the, in There's a high percentage of the forest 18th century sites in the Bingo area, is that right. what you're yes. saying? Okay. Yes. Uh, right. Does so that include the West Hill? This is, this is not a uh, West Hill too, is that including a high no, diversity? Uh, it's no, not even sure. in other no, story no. like Urbation. <laughs> yeah. so yeah. Those are later guys. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> From a, from a, a rich perspective, like yeah, it's it's a diversity of endangered species. Questions? Harlan? <coughs> what are the landings? The landings, so I'm going to see these little green stars. Yeah. These are the proposed landing sites. Some of these are existing, many of these are actually existing. They may not look like it today because they have trees growing on them, but they were once log landings. Um, and that's also true of um, like these road, these hall roads. Yeah. Most of these are roads. You know, if you were walking in the woods, yeah. you would say whether it's designated as a road or not designated as a road, it was a road at one point. Um, we're heavily roaded, small r. Um, so, but these are the landings, all these, and how much how much timber will go to that landing kind of depends on the treatment type and then how much volume is in there. What 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 are we talking for? Chipper, chipper, the landing. They might they might have a chip van into the landing. That's that's really up to the contractor. We don't specify what they do with the with the pulp wood that they take off. Um, some of it will go to firewood, some of it will get chipped, some of it will go to other uses. Do you allow to process firewood on site? I'm looking at three landings. They typically don't process firewood. They'll send it to a process. 200 horsepower, you know, you can pick up something the size of this building and drop in it. You know, I'm just kind of wondering. Yeah, they, I mean, I, I, I can't, I would assume that they would be op operating chippers yeah. at some of the sites. I don't know which sites. Um, we wouldn't know that, even be able to wave a flag at that until, you know, it, the right. site got contracted. So it'd just be, we can know, talk, we can then talk to them about, you know, what do you think you're going to you yeah. do this for? Well, I'm just kind of concerned with the noise thing for months on end. They typically would concentrate the chipping into a shorter period of time because it costs some money to keep the chipper on site. All down and then run the chipper yeah. like a day yeah. a week or yeah. something. Yeah. And they can dump a lot of chip waste on the way back out. Here again. Um, so will a fair amount of, of trucks be coming down what you call 64? Uh, is that uh, Wing, Wing Farm Road? Wing Farm Road. Road. Uh -huh. um, so if we, it's so funny, the colors up on the screen are not at all the colors on my computer. So, let me zoom out one more step. Yeah. There we go. Um, so all of... All of this, these harvest areas would be coming either down Wing Farm Road or down Maple Hill Road. There's the that old stone culvert right here. Um, on the Han piece of the Hancock Town Road, it goes loops around. Um, it shows that this is a haul road. We're not hauling over that culvert. We're not driving over that culvert. As part of our, that's one of the restrictions that will be in the contract. Thank we you don't feel it can support the weight. Um, so yeah. some of this wood, which will come down to here, will go out on Maple Hill Road. But the majority of this up in here will come down um, Wing Farm Road. And if the to estimate the number of trucks would be very hard because that would just depend on what the volume is in those stands. But there, yes, there will be truck traffic up and down that road. And the purple area is clear cutting. Purple no. areas. It's, it's a group, group selection. Oh, okay. <laughs> that would be a really big clear cut area. <laughs> it pretty much gets rid of all the old pine. I'm sorry, Arnold. Oh, plantation pine and all we're, that. We're working to get rid of the non-native plantation pine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Norway spruce. Now, is that something they're going to take off for logs, or are they going to chip all that crap? Uh, they will take it for logs. Okay. That, that, that darker purple is group selections. 
So that's that little little openings in mature forest. Chris, could you clarify what the uh, thinning, what they do in the thinning areas? A, th a thinning is that they will go in and they'll take, um, what they're trying to do is release some of the larger trees. So they're gonna go in and they're gonna take um, lesser form, poor, more poorly formed trees to try to release the trees that have better form and allow them to continue to grow. They're gonna go into things that you, we would look at and say, wow, that's crowded in there. Uh -huh. You know, none of the trees are being able to get a good crown development on them. So they'll go in and they'll remove some of the more poorly formed trees to allow the bigger trees to. So, so does that mean they still have a Making sure that it will be pulp, you're saying? Um, in those stands, it might be yes, but it could be firewood. It could be something else. It would be pulp. It would be pulp wood. Yes, but yeah. what they do with that, it would be hard to say. So it would still be like logging trucks going in, or yeah, you'd still have logging trucks going into those units because they'll take that wood out. So in a thin area, would you look at it and not necessarily be able to tell that they've done it, or you will say, oh yeah, they've definitely cut there. You can tell. You, you can tell. You, you would be able to tell. It wouldn't be like um, like a, some areas are proposed for shelter woods, like various stages of shelter woods, and that's where they go in and they remove most of the basal area that's in there, but they leave the best formed trees and the biggest trees behind to act as seed trees for the, for the, for the remainder of the area, and then you'll wait. 10, 15 years, and then go back in and remove those as the regenerating forest has re reached a certain age. So those are the ones that you look at and you go, wow, why are those it's just like, looks like a park yeah. out there. That's a shelter wood. But thinning, you can tell that they've done something, but it's still, a, it's, it looks like a mature forest still. Yeah. And, and is the, um, is it, do they do that in the wintertime? Um, so there's a mix of harvest seasons in here. Most of these harvests are winter harvest. Uh, most of the ground is winter ground. We are trying to do more summer harvesting um, for a variety of reasons. Silviculturally, uh, we can achieve better results if we get some ground scarification, yellow birch, sugar maple, um, some of our more desirable trees like to have the ground scratched up a little bit. It gives them a good seed bed. If you ever walk down an old logging road, they're usually thick with like hemlock or yellow birch or something like that. That's because it's been scratched up a lot. They love that as a seed bed. Um, it also keeps the operators love to have summer season because they're real busy in the winter and they often fall into a lull in the summer because there's a lot of winter harvesting that goes on. But we just don't... Um, our soils and the ground condition, it really depends on how much rain we get, you know, over the course of the summer, whether the ground will stay dry enough for us to be able to harvest in summer. So some units are absolutely winter. Some units are, the majority of units are probably absolutely winter harvest. There are some units that are, yeah, they're okay for summer harvest. And then there's a middle ground of units and it's displayed, it's in the, it's in the, it's in the document. Um, there's a, a ray in the middle that like, well, winter harvest, but if conditions are right, there's an opportunity for summer harvest. So you will be plowing and traveling over that road during this one or two years past the Harlan's house for- We won't, but the contractor will, that's yes. What, that's what I mean. Yeah. That's so, scheduled for winter, well, winter So that means, yeah. Okay. yeah. Cross Some of it is Harlan, absolutely. All right, so the cross country skiing won't be so good for those couple of years. No, it won't be. Plow yeah. to get up there. So we'll, we, we have the ability to, um, in the contract, come to terms with the contractor. We can also specify to the contractor in certain situations that um, they can only plow to a certain depth. So there still remains snow pack on the road, but it would be, it would be hard packed. It wouldn't be powder. Yeah. Um, if the road is wide enough, sometimes you can share the road with them. I don't think that road is probably no. wide enough. I mean, the reality, is, the reality is it'll be compromised for a couple of years while it's going on. And unless, the, unless you go up there and groom it. Right. The one thing that I have said, and I've been been working in the document and working with the, the timber staff here, is that um, in the sequence of harvesting units, to not have harvesting going on in Bingo and harvesting going on in the Chittenden Brook Nordic system at the same time. Okay. That there would always be one of those Nordic systems available for people to ski on. So if you're displaced from Bingo, you can go over to Chittenden Brook and vice versa. Um, it's not a perfect solution, but it's, it's the best you can do. Best I can do. So you're going to maintain your emphasis on keeping that a um, cross country ski trail. Pine Brook. Pine Brook. In the winter, yes. In the summer, it's mountain bikes and horse. We'll, we'll, we'll mountain bike place. 
Yes. Okay. I'll say it emphatically again for those of you who might be in the back of your minds. There is no motorized proposal in bingo. Can there be a sign at the end of the road that says that? Uh, we yeah. spoke about this sure. before. And I, I mean, we, if, we put, if, we, if we sign things like the camping and things like that, our kiosks say that when we put kiosks in, that's one of the things that goes on. We can emphasize that, yeah. Yep. Okay. Jeanette, you have your hand up. Could you go through the different shelter wood thinning and, and put a percent on those? That in thinning, we remove 40% of the trees or put some percents on the different areas? Off the top of your head. Yeah, I'm not sure I can do that off the top of my head. It's in the appendix, the environmental assessment, appendix A1. Our, it doesn't do the percent, forest. though, but you uh, could. That was a it gives you a range. What do you What do you ask, wait, let me just find out, What do you ask me? Like in a shelter, what's the percentage of in a shelter wood? What's the percentage of trees removed? Mm -hmm. Are you asking me what percentage of the overall harvest is shelter wood? No, in in a, in a designation like shelter wood. Yeah. What percentage of the trees are removed? Yeah, I, I 50, can't. 50, 80. I can't do that. Off the time. And it also depends because there's different various types of shelter woods. Um, there's different thinnings. Group selection would depend on how many groups you're putting in would be the percentage. I could like scale you up as far as the least number of trees removed would be like a single tree selection. And then you would go up to a, a, a group selection probably would be the next one. So you're removing the least amount of trees and then a thinning after that and then a shelter wood after that and then a clear cut after that. So clear cut would be the one that would obviously remove the most amount of trees, right? Um, but for me to sit here and be able to rattle that off and be able to stand behind it without digging in and asking my timber staff, I would, I would want to do that. So some of the information is that, Some of the information you're asking is in Appendix A1. I mean, uh, Charles, our, our forester, put a lot of time and effort to try to explain exactly what these treatments entail on the ground. He doesn't talk about it in terms of what you're probably looking for, as percentage of tree canopy harvested or number of trees, but it, it talks about it in terms of basal area, um, which is the amount of space that's occupied by the actual stem of the tree over an acre basis. Um, so you can sort of get an idea. It's, a, it's at the beginning of each number. It's, it's the entire appendix A1. So like page A1-1 talks about uneven age management. It starts talking about group selection right there. Right. Then, Just when you Google up shelter wood and look at images they, mm -hmm. they vary vastly from you know a single tree left to yeah. something looking yep. more like right. you know and that, de and that right. depends on what basal area you're reducing that stand to right and it says right here that the group selections would remove trees in a small area that vary in sizes from one tenth of an acre to up to three acres so it just gives you the range right there for, so a, group, of, yeah. for a group harvest Group harvest is like a like a mini clear cut. Like all the trees are removed in that. It's not a circle. I keep making a circle shape, but they're not circles. They're different. So you end up with like a checkerboard. Um, if you were looking at it from above, it would look like an irregular checkerboard. They're not spaced on that kind of regularity, but you would see openings scattered across the landscape. Little ones. Is that for that's wildlife for them? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Because they want like that young forest and then the mature forest. Right, but it's also it's so also objective so culturally because it, it favors trees that are um, intolerant to the sun. So species that thrive in shade, they grow better in those smaller spaces. Somebody back there, Chris. Yeah, was, go ahead. Susan, go ahead. Yeah, I should. No, um, I had, I had already raised it with the uh, um, select board about changing the seeing if we can change the speed limit on bingo. Um, but I want to know if, is, as far as the, uh, the Forest Service, do you have any say in your contractor saying, hey, we really, you need to go slow? I mean, I've asked the town if there's any way we can get it reduced to 25 miles per hour. Um, but I wanted to know if there's anything you as a Forest Service can do with your con logging contractors. Yeah, to when, when they're on the town road, they have to abide by the town speed limits. We can certainly request that they go slower yeah. uh, for various reasons. Um, 
you know, I'll, I'll tell you this, if you're driving a 60,000 pound log truck on an icy road, you're not gonna wanna be flying along. Okay. Um, you're gonna be creeping along. Okay. Now that's not to say that a 60 pound log truck doing 20, 60,000 pound log truck doing 25 miles an hour isn't an opposing sight coming your way, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, they're not gonna be ripping down the road at 50 miles an hour. Um, empty or full. Okay. There's not enough room in many of those places for two cars to pass when one no. of them is a logging truck. So yeah. they're going to radio back and forth and hold the truck. They'll, 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 be re they'll have to be responsible for, tra they're responsible for traffic control and to keep the road open and safe to the public. It's written into their contract. And we have one staff position here um, solely dedicated to interacting with timber contractors. He's a sale administrator and that's what he does. So he'll be out there every day working with the people coming yeah. out there going for it's not going to be too much of an issue if you're not there on the weekends. We can also do, Jay, I don't remember the the, the weekend hauling thing, that's, that's in the mitigation still, right? I think so. So we did put a mitigation measure in place, um, Jay's still going to double check for me here, that disallow, doesn't allow weekend hauling. So they can't haul timber on sure. the weekdays. Oh, that's great. They can go up and cut timber on the weekend. So they can go up and skid yep. and do everything, but yep. they can't yep. haul down the road on the weekends. Well, be, that's why I think so. Yeah. I, it was in there. All right, so we can Mason. go out on the weekends. Yeah, so uh, can you explain the reasonable access for landlocked uh, parcels and how that all works and all this? So there's, there's no, we don't have any a action in here granting access to, any, in bingo anyways, anybody who's landlocked. There are some special use proposals for access for people up the Hancock Tunnel, but there's nothing in bingo. And they, I can explain the process to you. If a, if a landholder is surrounded by or largely surrounded by federal ownership, we're required by the ANILCA, the Alaska Native Lands Interest Act, I think I got my acronyms, letters mixed up there, but you know what I mean, to provide um, access to that landowner to their property because we can't, um, we can't um, reduce the value of their property by saying, no, you don't have access. So it has, to be, it has to be reasonable access. Reasonable access is determined by, on a case-by-case -case basis. Depends on what, what's there. You know, if you have a property with no structure on it, reasonable access might be that mm, you get to hike. You know, we'll provide you a trail access. Or if you, you know, it, it just, it runs the gamut. Um, so and, really and you don't have to be completely surrounded by natural forests. You just have to demonstrate that it would be a hardship for you to gain access in by any other means. Like so, so with a, a piece that's been uh, sold that in full knowledge ahead of time understood the forest service uh, reasonable access defined as what reasonable access is to be four seasons three seasons what's reasonable it's a, it's a, well you can't deny someone access to their property in any season I mean, it depends on the, the use of the property that's a case-by-case -case basis you're, at, you're you're asking me a, you're asking for a specific answer to a general question i can't get to that access by walking can be access. can be accessed by car, it can be accessed by snowmobile, it can be accessed by ATV. It all depends. It's a case by case basis. So, yeah. so we have a lock gate on 62 for one season, for one of the four seasons. Is that within the reasonable access? Yeah. Mason, I'm not going to comment on yeah. something that relates to the lawsuit that's currently going on between okay, you, you and the town. I appreciate so that. So you can try to bait me into it. I'm but not, not going to work. I'm not baiting you. I just I'm just looking for. Yeah, uh, to yeah. understand reasonable access, that's yeah. all. You know, I mean, yeah. this is the place to come. Because you well, we've guys had the, we've, we've had this conversation providing. before, too, so, but I'm not going to comment on something that's going to, that relates to that lawsuit. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. But well, basically, you don't allow snowmobiling in national forests, basically. No, we do allow snowmobiling on the national forest on designated snowmobile right, trails. Right, right, yeah. Of yeah. which there are none in Of Bingo which there are none in Bingo Basin and none proposed in... Um, there never will be any designated public snowmobile trail um, in there because if you look at the context of the landscape with it being the Battelle Wilderness horseshoe around it, there's nowhere to go. Yeah. Um, so it would be an out and back trail and one of the things that we look at very closely is trail connections. There's just nowhere to go and there's no snowmobile club in the state that's going to propose a three mile dead end snowmobile trail. 
um, especially with the way that conditions are going lately in the winter, they're kind of shrinking their systems down to a core as opposed to blowing them out big. So. You come back around to the seasonal restriction on hauling, because um, you asked. Uh, hauling activities impacting snowmobile and ski trail shall not take place on weekends or federal highways, unless snow conditions do not allow snowmobile or skiing to occur. So, so we're the talking about Bingo bottom road. part of Bingo Road, they could haul out on. They wouldn't be able to haul out past Harlem's place on the weekend, because that's a that's a special entry. Unless there was no snow. <laughs> but, that, but that's not going to work anyway because there are landings. Well, I guess there are a couple of landings on that road, but there's not much. Yeah. That, yeah, this side of it. Yeah. I mean, right. side. yeah. Okay. So, uh, Eric. Well, I, uh, when, I guess then Bingo, or at least past the Four Corners, or actually is not actually a designated cross country ski trail, is it? No, but the bingo road between Harlan's and the Four Corners is. Is it? Yes, because it's the Pine Brook Loop Trail. Oh, that's part of the loop. So, uh -huh. so there would be a restriction in place on that section of the trail, which would prevent you from hauling from it's beyond there, past there. Oh, and, oh, that's okay. I don't know the question, but I forgot it, so no worries. Okay. <laughs> so we'll we'll quote you on that. You'll think. Getting close to that. Did Eric forgot his second Eric, question? No, no, no. That, that, that the weekends are free of logging trucks past Harlan's. Yeah, but by that mitigation by measure, measure, they would not be able to haul down that section of the road. They could haul up to right to the edge of it, I guess. If there's snow. I, I see you. Mm -hmm. Was there a question in the back? I saw that. So, so. Right, yeah, just yeah. to be clear, though, if there's no snow, right. that wouldn't apply. Yeah. Well, if there's no snow, I don't care. Right. <laughs> it's still winter. <laughs> it's still winter. Oh, that's true. Right, but it's related to snow. I understand that now. Yeah. Jeanette, I'm gonna, I see you over here. What am I going to get to? Flights. Like, like the state. Like the state? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah size areas are you proposing? Okay, so that is all contained in there. For me, I don't, I wouldn't be able to rattle it off off the top of my head. I mean, I could read you what's written in the document, but for me to do that off the top of my head, I, I, I don't know. There's stuff up there that you need to use like There is, um, well, there's elm planting going on on the White River. Uh, Jay's gonna look, look up and be able to get me some. But I mean, the classical invasive is honeysuckle barberry. No, 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 that's, that's, so, so invasive plant control, which we do use glyphosate for and other herbicides, is handled under a different decision. It's a forest-wide programmatic decision. So we don't have to reanalyze it and, and make that decision again in this document. That decision already exists. Okay. Um, and so that, for invasive plant control, that is in place already. What's being proposed in here are, is one was to control um, vegetation around the elm planting sites. We're planting elms along the White River, trying to restore some elms into the riparian areas, um, is to treat the competing vegetation. That's one of the things, and there was also another. Charles wanted to keep it as an option to apply it for site preparation anywhere you would be conducting natural or artificial regeneration harvest methods. So that basically covers anywhere where there's a shelter, shelter wood, Clear cut seed tree and group selection. So everything minus the thing. That would be the maximum area. Now, keep in mind that he's not planning to do that on every single acre. Right. He, he would be specific in areas where he felt like it would be needed. And the, the intent is that it's to control beach regeneration. So it would be it would be subject to the amount of beach that would be within those areas that, that are being harvested. But he doesn't know where that is until after the fact. Um, and so he left it open to be able to use it potentially in any of those stands. That's the way it's written right now. Well, so, so yeah, I mean, I'm just, the, the one done. page I'm looking at here, you know, 4,383 acres. Right. Um, yeah. But that's contingent on any number of other things restricting that activity. So if if beach is not a problem in those stands, and it, it would no way, in no way be a problem in every one of those stands. And I'm not saying it doesn't exist, I'm saying it becomes a problem that's out competing the desired regeneration in sugar maple, spruce, 
yellow birds, whatever, whatever the desire is, to a point where, okay, we need to do something here, otherwise we're gonna get a bunch of diseased beach back. Um, that would be a place. There's also restrictions on it from within that acreage that would be restricted by the botanist from a plant's perspective, the soil scientists, wetlands, all kinds of other things that would come into play that would shrink that acreage down, 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 down. So it's not, it would never be applied to all 4,000 acres. Might not be applied to one for all we know at this point. It's an option for treatment to control beach. An option that's looking for authorization. Yes, however. Yes. Yep. So within the mitigation measures of the for 4,000 plus acres of application. Yep. Within the within the mitigation measures that are contained in the project, it has to abide by the mitigations that are written for life and safe application and all other activities. So and that can't be done in the winter. It's got to be 45 degrees or something. Mm -hmm. so yeah. And yeah. you can't it's rain. 50 degrees. I have a question. It's hard to apply it. I mean, following all those rules. That's so right, which means it's usually applied not following. So this is this is also <laughs> site prep. So don't, the other thing that you can't think about is, or you can, don't <laughs> think about this is. is a broadcast activity. This is a target specific activity like that beech tree. We want to kill that beech tree and that little beech sprout and that little beech sprout. It's not, you're not spraying over the entire area. It's a targeted application. So again, it's not going to hit all 4,000 acres with a, that target. It's not like you're putting, potentially putting glyphosate on 4,000 acres of ground. And what's the radius after you shoot one spot? What's the radius? Yeah, it travels. Okay. No. It's target specific. It travels to where you shoot it to into that plant. It's what what in the soil or in the plant? Is it it's cut stump, right, Jay? Yes. Stump, yeah. stump shooting. So you're you're it's cutting the stump and you're spraying the exposed so it's not fully spray. exposed. It's not fully spraying. Spray. There's yes. a couple things to point out um, because it, it does sound alarming. You're sporting it. It does yes. sound alarming to apply a herbicide on a large yeah. acre like yeah. this. So it's it's a glyphosate product. Yes, it's not Roundup. It's uh, it's a water based. It's labeled to be used near water, um, so it's water. It's it's got uh, a special uh, added type of restriction as far as the type and impact that it could have on water. It's, it's, rodeo. You know, it's a much it's yes. rodeo. Okay, or rodeo. Or, yeah, rodeo is approved for aqua yes. water. Yeah. Or. So and the other thing about it too is that um, it, the the amount of the application rate would be much more restricted closer to the surface water buffers around surface water. And so it's worth pointing that out. And then the fact that it's not foliar strain, it is cut stump treated, so thus it, those particular products do not need to have surfactants right. added to them, like foliar strain does. And it's the surfactants that tend to be more toxic than the glyphosate itself. So those are things that are, that are spelled out and discussed in the analysis. And so there's mitigation measures um, in the appendix B to talk about those restrictions. No foliar strain. Uh, except, no. for the um, except for the except for the planting um, would be foliar spray. He's trying to kill the taller and make the average yeah, too, yeah. too small. But with all the surfactants, the mitigation is really maximum it so that it doesn't spread, it breaks up right away, it doesn't bind. But it's I'm a little concerned that the, there are definitional issues here when you refer to the toxicity of something. Glycosphate being, you know, in the headlines as carcinogens, major lawsuits being um, won or lost, depending on whose side you are. That Monsanto is known for decades of the carcinogenic effects of that product. Um, why it's not just, you know, banned across the board at this point, you know, is a question. Let alone. So the product that is, that is being litigated and the lawsuits are, are around is Roundup, which is a Monsanto product, which has glyphosate in it. The carcinogen, the, 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 the issue at the lawsuit is the surfactant that they're adding to it, not necessarily the glyphosate. It is the surfactant that is the highly toxic that they've been using. So. These products that we're talking about, aquatic glyphosates, don't have that surfactant. They don't have any surfactant in, 
in them because there's no need to stick to a leaf, which is what the surfactant does. It, it's a sticker. So basically, so, you can apply it until the day of harvest. So. Um, I would have to read the label on that, Arlen. Um, a harvest of what are you talking about? A tree, sure. A tomato. You wouldn't you you wouldn't use it on a tomato because it's an. I just you know. Yeah. Just. Yeah. You know. that, I mean, if you can eat it, it's probably safe. Safe. safe to eat. Sure. You know. Right after. It doesn't kill rats. Just saying. Just saying. It doesn't all. kill rats. You know. Roundup was safe at one time. You know. <laughs> no, it wasn't. They just made you think it was. Yeah, you have a question. Yeah, so, <coughs> with the, uh, Mr. Word, Elm, Cotton, I think it's yep. so you're going to play an Elm a lot. Yes. Dutch Elm disease is not a... These are, these are um, disease-resistant Elms that they have developed. Uh, it's, we're doing it in, uh, in, in partnership with um, the Nature Conservancy. They're, they're a trial run. It's actually more than a trial. They, they know that these elms are disease resistant in plantations, um, and they're just starting to scatter them around. And they've done them out in the wild, too, on a limited basis, and they've done very well. And so now they want them to plant them in a little bit more concentration than they have in the past um, out in a wild setting. So. But you're spraying the foliage. We're around. spraying the competing because we're planting them. spraying oh, with the foliage, with the surface. No, the same, the same, the same, the same uh, substance. We're not. We're you're, we're adding a surfactant, a non-toxic surfactant to. There's okay. non-toxic varieties of surfactant. Uh, I, I shouldn't say non-toxic. Nothing is non-toxic. Even water is toxic at some dose. So, a a less toxic um, surfactant to the mix to allow it to stick to the vegetation there. And we're talking about th those are spraying an area like that big around around where the where the elms are planted. It's yeah, a different subject, uh, or micro on the landings uh, near Harlan's up there. Yep. Yeah. So, what will the road look like when you're all done? Because right now it's also part of the ski loop, it's part of the recreational use. So, will it be returned to its current way it looks, or? That's a good question. Or so, land landings, just in general. No, no. Right. <coughs> They turn around over the bridge, up the hill. You're going to have truck traffic going to land. And what will the road look like when all this is over? Okay, hold on. Guess the password. One 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 one. Password is. So I'm going to move down this way. So yeah, so truck traffic will be on that little section of the road right there. That's this wood right here going to be pulled out this way yeah so there is no road I mean there's this little section of road so it will look essentially like it does today you're going to be turning it to what it looks like today well it won't be grown in with grass right after it's used but it will grow in with grass after it's you're not going to need to rebuild it to get that machines up there I mean, you're going to have to do something to it to, to use it because it's not well, we'll usable have to, for heavy we'll, trucks right now. We'll have to improve the road so that a truck can go on so it. you're going to it after you're done? It'll be graded, water bars put in, so turned up a little bit, seeded, and let go. It will, to make different. Sure. It will not be what it is now. It will definitely be improved. Well, well, that's a town road or not a town road? That is that's not, the old bingo road. Not a town road. It's the old bingo road. Not, not, that section is not a town road. So you're talking about well, this little it? piece right here, this right here, right? Beaver Bridge. After the bridge. Yes, Beaver right Bridge. Yeah. And the mailbox is So the road, the the pine, the pine, this is Pine Brook Trail right here. So you're talking about this section of the road will look, right after it will look like a road, three years after it will look like a grassy field, and ten years after it will look like a bunch of saplings. No, I'm talking about the actual driving surface. And that's what I'm talking about, too. You're not going to be across the bridge? Mason, when when, okay, when, when we're doing the harvesting, it will look like a road. It'll be cleared, it'll be graded, it'll be colored and sprayed. That road will look exactly like it does now. With all that heavy equipment. Well, I mean, if you create the road. The that you currently drive on up to your house? Yeah. Yes, will look just like it does now. So if you run it, you'll grade it? Yeah. 
It's, it's in the contract. They have to restore it. After the operation, they usually yeah. have it better. I thought you went beyond like, where the brook trail splits off. No, that road will look just like it does now. But it has to be improved for that type of truck traffic. It's, it's already to a standard to, to support that type of truck traffic. The contractor is not the way they want it. That bridge is built to. I'm not talking about the bridge, I'm talking about the hill after the bridge. Yeah, no, that's. It's going to be torn up. They will create it and restore it to its current they're condition. They're going to keep it in driving oh, condition yes. while they're doing their work. Yes, they have to because it's it, it access to your home. It'll look the way it does now. Yep. Yeah. Motion to adjourn. Back with Harley. Doing that kind of meeting? Harley's going to the map. Going to the map. So, I'm looking at fish landing right here. Existing landing right there, so if you went there, you it's gonna look like a like. And then there's a sand pit probably right here. Yeah, that's that's probably that dock itself. Okay, so, so both of the these landings are like down the road from where you go up the basin space. Yeah, they're past that. They're, they're past the fort, a couple hundred yards. Yeah. So you go up and then basically goes this way, and the pipe work trail goes this way. They're down this way. They will make whatever improvements is necessary if they feel that road is not to a standard. They'll make the improvements to the road. And then they'll restore it to the condition. They'll probably leave it better than it is now. Well, that's a question mark. Yeah. Who's, who thinks it's better? Well, I like it the way it is now. Okay. So what you consider, or somebody considers better, might be a class three road that I'm not going to be a class th three road. Uh, Sorry, Chris, I'm not going to stay till nine. You're on your own. Kevin. <laughs> very Same nice here. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Chris. Anyone else? Last chance. Last chance. Seconded. You make some of these, most of these landing zones were existing. They, most of the, I don't know so what the percentage is, but they do. Well, I know in, the, in this, it mentions 80 landings to be newly constructed. Okay. The, so there's. There are new, I didn't, yeah, there are new landings to be constructed. Half acre How many landing zones? Are in total? Is that in addition to the old one? There's, 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 there's likely a total. Of them on your map. Well, you're just looking at one. We're looking at very, we're looking at only like a third. If I zoom out to the complete extent of this map, we're only looking at about a third of the total of the project area. Is there a total number of landings listed in there? There must be somewhere. James, he's the data guy tonight. Because that's 40 acres of clear cut right there. Yeah, there would be definitely there. Would be. Yeah, Chris, the way that it's written in here, Josh, we probably should true this. It doesn't sound right to me. It says an estimated 88 landings would be needed. Eight of them uh, existed prior for, from prior to the requiring 80 newly constructed landings. Yeah, it's pretty sure true that because that doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound right. But yes, you're right, Jeanette. I mean, your statement is correct. I mean, that would be a new landing would be a small clear cut. It would be a what we would call it, like a patch. Oh, just half acre. Yeah, yeah. So not a patch. Maybe 40 acres total clear cut just for the landings. Right. Yep. Depending on what, well, clear cut regardless, who knows what kind of vegetation is growing on some of them. Some of it could be more scrubby stuff. Yeah. Even those are, as far as landings are concerned, those are proposed landings. The actual position or actual place of the landing will appear when the sail begins to start moving along. Yes, because. <clears throat> The landings are somewhat flexible in terms of with them, and a lot of those landing docks you have are sitting on archaeological sites. 
Right. So that'll be truth at the time of implementation. Like, oh, we can't put this here because there's an archaeological site identified from here. We're going to put it, you know, over here instead. Um, and you know, the, what we were just looking at, where we were just looking at, was way back here again. Um, it's the cemetery. You know, with these two landings side by side there, you know, those two landings are very close together for for this, if it's this amount of wood coming out of there, um, it wouldn't surprise me that when we get to implementation, there's only one landing there. Remember, this is the extent of what can happen. It can go, become less. It can't become more without a further analysis. I had made a suggestion too, because you have two landings on Flanders Hill, one on either side, and if you could aggregate it all on the right. east side at the existing landing, that would save the archaeologic site above the cemetery. Yeah, and some of them will get filtered out because of that reason, like we can't put a landing there because there's an arc site, yeah. and we've got to use that one. And you know, the, the timber contractors are going to want to limit the amount of landings that they create as well once it goes under contract, because every landing that's constructed is an expense to, to them. They have to pay for it, yeah. and then they have to put it to bed at the end, so they want to reduce that number as well. Would that mean that there'd be more truck traffic to uh, to the landings, the fewer landings? No, I mean when they're side by side like this, like this, just using this as a conceptual example right here. You know, like with those two so close together, um, what's the, what's the reason to have two landings close together? Maybe uh, maybe there is one. I just don't know what it is. But that could be a case where they would say, you know, we're just going to haul everything to this landing, and we're not going to construct this landing um, because there's no need to do that. And it could be also, I mean, going back to Eric's point about archaeology, I don't know if that's the case here. Again, I'm talking conceptually. It could be that there's two landings here because they have to be smaller because there's some feature around them that they can't intrude upon. Or something, yeah. Yeah. Chris, I had made a suggestion that uh, the project recognize Robinson as an entity. Does the Forest Service have any reaction to that? Yeah, I mean, we, t we talked about that, and that'll probably, that would become part of the, like, the, the historic, what we do when we get to the, the CCC camp and the other things that we talked about, the heritage resources section, we'll work with Andrew, our archaeologist, on trying to come up with something to recognize that. It will probably be when, at the CCC camp itself, um, or maybe on an, an interpretive side, or one of the kiosks that goes in down in that, in that area, like when we move that kiosk to the campground, it's a little far, far away, but. Yeah, we, we did take note of that. Right, when it came yeah, Joey King's pond. Yeah. Possible. Yeah. yeah. Again, that being private property, we probably wouldn't do anything there unless Andy wants to give us yeah. the pond and the land around it, which probably doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but you're going to fix the dam for it. I'm not sure. Yeah, we are going to try to help out with the dam a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not the. It's not actually the dam. It's actually the, the sidewall. Yeah. Yeah. Is it, where is it recognized as Robinson anywhere other than the top of the topographical map? I've never seen that. Robinson was the, where, is, where is Janice? Robinson was yeah. the mill. Yeah. He was the owner of the mill, right? One mill. Yeah, yeah. five mills at one time. It was more appropriately because Janice could call it West, West Rochester. Yeah, but <laughs> the post office was West, West Rochester. Yeah. Wow. But the idea of putting that information on one of those kiosks, I think, is really very nice. Yeah. You see. Yeah. You're, you're entering an historical area. A unique area, area yeah. that's been used and that has I was a long thinking history. if we could reconstruct a plot map of where the sawmills were and the church and the uh, stagecoach in and the dance hall. And yeah, we have been world. working on a lot but of that, that kind of interpretation <laughs> lately, trying to do interpretation. So we will definitely leave that off. Yeah. Yeah. We will bring in the historical society when we, when we get to that yeah. phase um, as the partner we work with in developing it. So. Um, he some tall, the Civil War guy, but yeah, you know, I didn't realize that. Just, I just a quick question. I'm, I'm having these uh, visions of Wing Farm Road just <laughs> getting. <laughs> it's trips. not a good road as it is, <laughs> yeah. and then Upper Maple Hill and Down Maple Hill yeah. and log logging trucks. Yep. Uh, right now they're working on the culvert and that's not a pretty picture right now. It'll be a great improvement when it's done.
done. Well, yeah, but uh, anyway, I'm just thinking of equipment, uh, logging trucks, and whether is there some agreement with the town that there'd be road repair, so if need be? That, that's an agreement between the contractor and the towns, and our responsibility with that is to ensure that the contractor is aware that he needs to reach out to the town, have all the required permits if he's an over if he's an overload, mm -hmm. you know, respecting the time of year, restrictions on roads, you know, not hauling in mud season, that kind of thing. But that that relationship is entirely between the town and the contractor. Rochester is probably a, a uh, in, a, in a better position, um, they're a little more aware than some of the other. We have a lot of towns that just don't, they don't engage with the contractor. They they wait till the end, and the contractor you know reaches out to them, and they don't do anything. Um, Rochester will I'm sure will be more on top of that particular issue. They can enter into agreements on bonds and things like that. They're supposed to have a bond with the town if there's any damage to the road that that bond is then utilized to make the repairs to the road. I can't imagine it so, not having some yeah. damage with yeah. the, the heavy equipment. When does it start? Well, we haven't signed the decision yet, so the decision has to get signed. Um, and we're, well, that's probably at the best we would reach a final decision probably in October. Right? If it gets uh, objected to and there's a process there, it could be out further into November, early December before we reach an outcome. And then the first sales, the first timber sales are planned, scheduled at this point to be sold, sold, not harvested, um, in our fiscal year 19. So that would be our next fiscal year. Um, and then most contracts have a lifespan of three to five years. Timber contracts have a lifespan of three to five years. So they have to be in, they can take up to five years to harvest of the area. Most of them like to get in and out a lot quicker than that, um, as long as there's no hold of with, you know. Um, there, if it's a winter harvest, winter harvest units, they're sort of at the whim of the winter. You know, if you don't get enough snow cover and the ground never freezes up, they can just, ne they can never get in there. So that's, contracts can get, you know, that's when they take this longer. I got an email from Citizens Task Force in Maine. We're saying that the, the amount of money from the sales was going to be, uh, there, in other words, it, it, we were not going to be making a profit on the sales, and this was going to be harvested, costing taxpayers to harvest it. No, they pay us. I mean, there's there's no cost to the taxpayer from this. The timber the timber is sold. But the, there was like this, the, the the value of the timber wasn't equal to the cost. The value of the timber isn't equal to the cost of the, yeah, but the cost isn't borne by the, the public because the, it's the timber purchaser that's bearing that cost. So the, all timber sales are appraised at a certain value. And there's, there can be minimum bids on timber sales that you have to reach a minimum bid, otherwise it won't be sold. And so what happens with the money that results from a timber sale is, um, it depends on the kind of sale it is. Um, typical traditional timber sales that money goes just back into the treasury and it's utilized for any number of programs um, throughout the country some of it comes back to the forest service some of it would go to health and human services some of it go to you name it um, there are other sales that are called stewardship sales or there's other ways that we can um, kind of keep some of the money that locally that comes out it's called uh, the the Knudsen Van, I'm going to call it KB. Can't say it. Jay, help me out. Knudsen Vandenberg. Vandenberg? Knudsen Vandenberg Act. There are senators from the 1950s. That's why you can't remember. Yeah, those. I know. And so, so it, it enables us to keep some of the receipts, they call it retained receipts, for us to do local work, to do watershed restoration, water, water protection, soil protection. Um, some of them allow a little bit of like infrastructure work on roads and trails um, to restore roads and trails that are impacted by timber sale activities. And then stewardship contracting is a goods for services exchange. You harvest this timber, and in exchange for you getting to harvest this timber and keep this timber, we want you to rehabilitate this road. We want you to, um, you know, 
do work like you do at the CCC camp, hire a contractor to do um, large woody debris placement, you know, pay for this aquatic organism passage culvert. Um, there, it's even, you never used to be able to do recreation oriented work with it, but there's now um, some, some bills churning through um, Congress that would allow a more expansive look at what you can use stewardship contract stewardship receipts for it, so that it would allow you to use it for recreation infrastructure as well. Trails, bridges. <laughs> yeah, it would stay here on this forest that we would use in, in this, typically in this project area to do work. Um, and they're also expanding that where we could use it outside the project area now if there's, if there's a specific need that's identified. So what would be the minimum bid for this uh, project? It's whatever it's appraised at. In each timber sale, I, 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 can't, I can't answer that, Jeanette. We okay, have so people that do that. appraised at by board feet or how is they that appraised? They appraise it by the value of the timber. I'm not a timber appraiser. I can't, I can't answer they that do. question. It, it is board feet, right? I think now they do it by cubic. Oh, CCF? Yeah. yeah. Which I don't relate to. They assign a value to person, it. But there will be a minimum bid based there is on. A bid. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. Depends yeah. On the species too. Might be. Yeah, it depends on the species yeah. too. It really depends on the market when they, when they do the appraisal. If, you, the, if you're if you're harvesting. Type of wood that, that, that particular yeah. sale entails. So it really depends. And do you add to that your cost for the project? I mean, I can't imagine what, you know, just 105 pages and environmental impact statement and all the research yeah. must have cost. Do you have any idea what it has, the project has cost so far just in the analysis? We haven't tallied the cost. I mean, we, we, we could take a ballpark estimate. I, I can't give it to you now, but we could sit down and put pencil and paper and try to figure that out. Um, I mean, it'd just be a shame to cut all the trees down and not at least make a monetary profit. It's, to me, it's not yeah. all about it's monetary time. profit. I mean, there's a forest health and resiliency component to this as well. Um, that if we have all mature, over mature, old growth forest, the diversity of the forest is very, very low. It fits only one suite of species that like that particular forest type. And most species, need early successional habitat, they need mid-successional habitat. Even species that occupy old forests, our research has found that they forage and feed in openings in early successional forests and they nest there. So it's, so it's not only a monetary thing. I mean, yes, you're right, if, we, if it was costing us millions of dollars to put out a timber sale and we were getting nothing in return for it, yeah, there would be, but there's, there's a balance in ecological health as well that we're trying to achieve through forest management. What is wildlife management, recreation management, there's other things that are at play other than the bottom the bottom line. So, so in that bottom line, is that also including climate change? Yes, we, we're we're looking at is climate change very very closely. There, you're gonna in the final EA there's a there's a new we've done some additional um, analysis on carbon that's gonna be in the final EA that our, our researchers have coming done. out next week? Uh, next, yeah, we, we, Jay and I are hoping so, to finish everything up by Wednesday of next week and then probably the end of next week. So you guys are working all weekend? We're, 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 we're trying to finish it up. We're trying to finish it up today. And uh, we both realized that um, we would have to work all weekend uh, to be able to do so, and neither of us really wanted to do that. So um, we punted to next week. It's going to rain all weekend, so you might as well. I gave him the weekend. Yeah, he gave me the weekend. Uh, Jeanette, just for whatever, whatever it's worth, on it, on page 48 of the of the old year, I guess it's a copy that you have now. And this isn't going to change in the in the final one coming out next week, but it does it does provide at least a cursory attempt of the economic analysis from from the uh, timber portion of the project, the cost of um, preparing the sales and the expected. Uh, amount of receipts, but it's again very cursory because we don't know all the site specific details, so it's 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 general and the best we can do up front. But because it's federal land, you could never benefit from the from selling carbon sequestration by your acreage because you're federal property, you can't gain from that, correct? Yeah. Uh, we yeah we couldn't be in a cap and trade system. Yeah, if that's what you mean. Yeah, yeah. No. I mean whereas with the private landowners are putting hundred acre blocks together and then 
completely. Yeah, what the nature of conservancy just had that yeah. big article that came out about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, we, we couldn't do that. that. And no. it's a shame because that would be a great revenue stream, but they can't do it. It's federal property. I mean, we can still we contribute to it, we just can't get paid for it. Oh. <laughs> we owned a town of sulfur when they were selling the sulfur, what did they call them? Oh, the right. sulfur emission? Yeah. Whatever? Yes. Yeah. We have a ton. <laughs> you bought a ton of sulfur. You bought a ton of sulfur. <laughs> Does it smell? <laughs> Does it smell? No smell. No smell. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that there was further analysis done on the carbon sequestration yep. and the release. Yeah, yeah. We, we, there's more, and with that, there's more there. coming all the time as that, that, as that research advances and it gets more fine-tuned. There's more coming out all the time. Yeah, I'm not even going to pretend I understand it all, but we had a couple of soil, or I'm um, sorry, carbon scientists from the research branch of the Forest Service out of our Washington office working with us, and they, used, they put together this uh, pretty extensive peer-reviewed scientific literature-based uh, report on the carbon stock influx of the, of the Green Mountain National Forest and what that means site-specifically on the Robinson Project. Is that because this was not... Yeah, it'll be part of the record. It'll be part of this. Well, yep. Oh, okay. well, it'll be a report it'll, it'll on be an environmental assessment. All the literature are cited with the in there. It's publicly available. Yep. And you will announce that when it's available? It'll be available once this is It'll be available next week. We put this out together. there. Because next week. this document estimated that within seven years, the carbon sequestration would be um, equivalent to what it is now, which is beyond my ability to believe that seven-year-old scrub can be sequestering the same as a mature tree. But there's more of them. Well, and you're getting rid of some of the stuff that's going to die and give off more carbon than it's sequestering anyway, so you're balancing that forest health so that in seven years, you're back to a point that you'll never achieve if you don't do anything right now. If you do nothing, you'll never get there. Yeah, and you're, and you're referring specifically to one very small component, and that was the only part of the document that addressed it was in, uh, in relation to the prescribed fire on a pretty small portion of the project area, and that's where our, our fuels just put together as far as the amount of carbon emissions from that burning. That's what that was about. What yeah. This, what I'm talking about. Oh, okay. So they were saying that it would take seven years just to recoup the carbon released in the burning. Correct. Now that makes more yeah. sense. Yeah, that's what that was specific to. This addition to the analysis that we're talking about now talks about carbon, the carbon uh, sink, carbon source, carbon influx, influence of this project on that dynamic here in this forest from timber harvesting. So you can look at that and see what you think when it comes out. I'm just not a believer that when you cut down a mature tree and you lose all that carbon sequestration that that tree's doing every day, well, during leaf season, and removing that times thousands that you're not contributing to climate change by leaving all that carbon in the atmosphere that otherwise would have been sucked out. That's what the report's about, right? Read, read the important report. Yeah, yeah I mean, this, this is new stuff yeah, that you guys are working with because we're at a crucial point and everybody's sweating in here. I'm sweating in here. <laughs> is that we got to start deciding exactly how to manage this wood related to this issue. So, wait till next week. Yeah, it's, everything could change by next week. Is it safe to assume that a healthy forest would take care of more carbon than what we presently have? I'm saying like <coughs> six, seven, eight years down the road. I mean, this is to improve the forest the thing and all that. I mean, it would seem that you're getting a better stand of timber that would be capable of, oh, I see what you know, getting more carbon out of the... Well, this is the the scientists are going to be letting us in on, right? Oh, I mean, I don't I know. Mean, that's I what mean, they're just, doing. You know, they're just, in the process of figuring yeah, out. Yeah, I mean, based what I've read, pretty basic. But based what I've read, that, that's, that's a true statement, that you're healthier, 
more resilient for a certain kind of be taking more carbon out of the atmosphere and less storing it in the stock than in mature forest and something done that. Once it reaches a uh, state of maturity, it's done. It's not really taking much more. Look out California and everything burning and all that shit going into the house. I, I don't think it has anything to do with growing each one of those leaves on that mature tree, no matter how mature it is. But as a tree matures, it then, like all of us do, starts to senesce a little bit, branches die, you lose some of that crown, you lose some of the vigor that it has. At that point, it's not absorbing the amount of carbon as a mature, healthy, robust teenager might be doing. So I think that, that's what you know the research is going to tell us. Yeah, it's it's the oil science. Yeah, just just wait. And I understand your question, and then we could debate it and talk about it. Yeah, for the rest of the evening. Just uh, hold, hold your hold your thoughts, and then if there's something in that report that just doesn't sit well with you, you know, we'll, I'm sure we'll hear from you on that. But the point is, is that there's a lot of research that that is cited that substantiates what's in the report. So just dive in. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to look through it, see what you think. Yeah, climate covers one of those things where you want those specials to look at. Yeah, it'll be part of the final report. Yeah, yeah. It'll be online. So what's that part called, not analysis, but what's the next step? So, so you have on your Robinson project, scoping, pre-scoping, oh, yeah. analysis, what's so that one going to be? We'll release the final EA. Final EA. Okay, so okay. what the final EA yes. means is it's all the, we've taken into consideration all the comments that we received on the draft, either preliminary okay. EA. We've looked at those, we've incorporated those, we'll respond to those comments, and we put out the final EA. It will look something like this. There will be maybe small changes to this based on the comments that we received. Um, and then, and the carbon, the, the, what we were just talking about is the big change that will be in it, relates to carbon. Okay. And then the draft decision notice, so the, the final decision, but in a draft form, unsigned, will go out accompanying it, okay? And then that will go out for a 45-day objection period. And then that once that 45-day objection, the objection period passes. If there are objections, then we will go. There will be a objections. There's a 45-day objection sort. period and an objection team That's separate from this right. office. Called the sort. Forest Service specialist, probably in our regional office in Milwaukee, will review it and provide feedback to Chris is the responsible official on what may or may not need to be addressed. And that could be another 45 days. It's a 45 day review process. Days. And, then, so and then Chris, to just say, just for sake of argument, there's issues that need to be addressed because of the objection or objections, then the Chris would have to have his uh, resource team address those in the final rendering of the environmental assessment before he can sign the decision notice. And there would be public comment during that process? No. But, but other publics, individuals can be involved in that uh, objection process. And that's the difference between the appeals process and the objection process, which you were talking about before. In the appeals process, there was no involvement. It was like that hard wall. You appealed. OK, now you're the appealer. I'm the Forest Service. We are not going to talk. We are going to have separate things. And you, we will render our decision on this appeal. Somebody else would. With the objections process, we can talk, we can work together, we can bounce things back and forth, we can make small changes, we can make changes to, to the decision based on what we find out. Um, and then at the end of that, if there are no objections, then the decision would be signed, it would be final, and we'd work on the implementation plan and starting to implement some of the things we have. You don't need to wait for funding? Uh, depends on what, some things we need to wait for funding on, some things like a timber sale or some of the things oh, that are special use permits, things like that, we would just go ahead and start to issue those. We would get the, it's not really low hanging fruit, but the low hanging fruit. Um, and then some of the things will certainly take longer, the repeater sites, um, some of the trail work would, would take longer because we'd be looking for funding. 
and then anything that would need, you know, further that's conceptual, like the trails, some of the other things we talked about today, that are, you know, they're in the decision. We know what we want to do. We know within a sphere of influence where we want to do it, but they need to be ground truth. That would happen prior to any implementation. So you get archaeologists, botanists, soil scientists, whomever out on the ground, wildlife biologists, um, to check those that areas before it got implemented, even once we had funding. At least as far as the archaeologist goes, that means then... You have to have consultation. But that means then you're subtracting area out of the sale. So no, I wasn't, talking about the, I wasn't talking about the sale area, Eric, I'm sorry. In that context that I was saying, I was thinking more about the trail, like the recreation project. They need to get out on the ground and like truth exactly where the trail is going. The timber things, that will have to be worked out before it goes to contracting. Before it goes out to bid, you would have to have all the arc sites um, reserved out. Well, you said you weren't going to work this weekend, yeah. but you are working this yeah. weekend right now. <laughs> Chris, thank you. Thank, thank you, Greg. Thank you so there, there are the, the ladies who came in late. I think there's four of you. Um, if you wouldn't mind coming over here and just writing your name down so we know who was here tonight, that would be very helpful. Do you need help putting chairs back together? No.